Number five, Gertrude Banaszewski. Gertrude Banaszewski, a name etched in infamy, became the orchestrator of one of the most gruesome and heart-wrenching crimes in American history. Born in 1929, she seemed like an ordinary woman, but beneath the facade lurked a malevolence that would shock the nation. Gertrude's path to darkness intersected with the life of Sylvia Likens, a young girl entrusted to her care. The Likens family, facing personal struggles, sought assistance from Gertrude, believing her to be a pillar of support. Little did they they know this decision would prove catastrophic and fatal for Sylvia. What unfolded within the walls of Gertrude's home was a systematic and sadistic campaign of injury and cruelty against Sylvia Likens. The cruelty inflicted upon the innocent girl was beyond comprehension. Gertrude, fueled by a toxic combination of jealousy, anger, and a perverse desire for control, subjected Sylvia to unimaginable, unforgivable torment. Gertrude's cruelty extended beyond physical injuries. She engaged in a twisted form of psychological logical warfare. Manipulating Sylvia's emotions, Gertrude carefully molded an atmosphere of fear and despair. The torment inflicted was not merely physical, but a calculated attack on Sylvia's mental state. Gertrude's malevolence was amplified by the complicity of her own offspring and neighborhood youths. They became willing participants in the heinous acts, contributing to the atmosphere of terror that surrounded Sylvia Likens. Gertrude's ability to influence others to join in on her atrocities is a display of the chilling charisma that dwelled within her malevolent nature. The revelation of Gertrude Banaszewski's crimes sent shockwaves through the community and the nation. The public, repulsed by the unspeakable acts committed against Sylvia, expressed their collective outrage. Gertrude's actions transcended the boundaries of human decency, earning her the disdain of society at large. Justice, though delayed and brought far too late, eventually caught up with Gertrude Banaszewski. The legal system, tasked with holding perpetrators accountable, recognized the gravity of her crime. Gertrude faced the consequences of her actions in a court of law, where the enormity of her deeds was laid bare for all to witness. Gertrude Banaszewski's name has become synonymous with evil. Her crimes against Sylvia Likens serve as a reminder of the capacity for darkness that can reside within seemingly ordinary individuals and seemingly ordinary families and neighborhoods even. The legacy of infamy she left behind continues to haunt the collective conscience, a true testament to the depths of human depravity. Number four. Leopold II of Belgium. Leopold II of Belgium, who reigned from 1865 to 1909, is remembered not for his nation building efforts, but for the atrocities committed during his brutal exploitation of the Congo Free State. This dark chapter in history has left a reddened stain on Leopold's legacy, leading him to be widely viewed as an evil figure, despised by the collective public. Leopold's insatiable greed drove him to exploit the Congo Free State for its large array of rubber and ivory resources. Forces. Under the guise of humanitarian and philanthropic endeavors, he embarked on a ruthless mission that subjected the indigenous population to forced labor, physical harm, and systemic cruelty. The rubber trade in particular witnessed horrifying events, as the Congolese people endured unimaginable suffering to meet the never-ending demands of the European market. Leopold's agents, tasked with maximizing profits, employed horrific methods to enforce rubber quotas. The Congolese people were subjected to forced labor, with villages facing severe consequences if they failed to meet the imposed quotas. The horrors extended to widespread mutilations, where hands were amputated as a grim means of punishment and control. The reign of terror aimed to instill fear and compliance among the exploited population. The relentless exploitation and unimaginable conditions led to an alarming death toll in the Congo Free State. Countless lives were lost due to disease, malnutrition, and the direct consequences of Leopold's merciless rule. The human cost of his economic ambitions was staggering leaving a trail of devastation that scarred the region for generations. As news of the atrocities in Congo emerged, an international outcry against Leopold's actions gained momentum. Humanitarian organizations, investigative journalists, and prominent figures denounced the inhumane practices and called for an end to the atrocities. Leopold's reputation, tarnished on the global stage, prompted widespread condemnation. Leopold II's legacy is now one of infamy and hatred, despite his attempts to portray himself as as a benevolent, fair, and justified leader, the atrocities committed under his rule have left a mark on history, forever tying him to his heinous actions. Number three, Vlad the Impaler. Vlad the Impaler was a 15th century ruler, left infamous for his sadistic acts. His reign, characterized by extreme cruelty, has earned him a reputation as one of the most despised figures of all time. Vlad's rule in Wallachia, a region in present-day Romania, is categorized as a reign of terror. He gained notoriety for his 
unrelenting brutality towards his enemies as well as his own subjects. His preferred method of execution, impalement, became synonymous with his name. Thousands met a gruesome end impaled on long, sharp stakes, a macabre spectacle that struck fear into the hearts of anyone unfortunate enough to cross his path. Vlad's cruelty reached its apex with the infamous Forest of the Impaled. After successfully defending his realm against invading forces, he ordered the impalement of all captured soldiers. The grisly display of impaled bodies served as a deterrent, a horrifying warning to anyone who dared challenge his authority. The forest of skewered victims was a perfect display of Vlad's merciless resolve. Vlad employed a variety of sadistic methods to instill fear, beyond impalement. Reports describe gruesome acts of prolonged harm, including boiling, mutilation, and skinning. His cruelty extended to both political enemies and to those within his own court, as he wielded his power with an iron fist, showing no mercy to anyone perceived even as a minuscule threat. Vlad's capital witnessed some of the most heinous acts of his rule. The citadel, a symbol of his power, became a site of horror. Tales of impaled bodies lining the approaches to the fortress circulated widely, creating an aura of dread that permeated throughout the region. Vlad the Impaler's legacy is one of unmitigated hatred. His extreme sadism has cast a long shadow over history, leaving a stain that prevails centuries later. While some argue that his methods were a response to the turbulent times in which he lived, the sheer barbarity of his rule has ensured that he remains a despised figure. Number 2. Delphine Lalori. Delphine Lalori personally carved a gruesome chapter in history during the early 19th century. Her actions have left an irrefutable mark on history, permanently painting her as a figure of malevolence and horror. Lalori's residence in New Orleans concealed a macabre reality behind its elegant facade. The mansion, a house of unspeakable horrors, bore witness to the twisted deeds that unfolded within its walls at Delphine's hands. It became the epicenter of one of the most notorious crime scenes in American history. The discovery of LaLaurie's atrocities sent shockwaves through the community. Unearthed secrets revealed a horrifying panorama of extreme forms of prolonged harm and torment inflicted upon forcibly employed individuals who were held captive within her mansion. The depths of her depravity left the entire city in disbelief. The revelation of LaLaurie's sadistic acts provoked a visceral, heart-wrenching reaction from the public. The community, once unaware of the horrors lurking behind closed doors, turned against her with an overwhelming sense of repugnance. The magnitude of her cruelty fueled a collective anger that transcended the societal boundaries. Despite the gravity of her crimes, Delphine Lalori managed to escape the clutches of justice. Her ability to evade the consequences of her actions only added to the public's fury. The sense of injustice further intensified by the disdain harbored for her. Delphine Lalori's legacy is one stained with the deepest hues of hatred. Her name became synonymous with cruelty cruelty and inhumanity, a symbol of the darkest, most twisted corners of the human soul. The atrocities committed within the confines of her mansion continued to cast a long, haunting shadow over her memory, and the memory of those who surrounded her. The infamy surrounding Delphine LaLaurie endures through time. Generations later, her name remains a shocking reminder of the capacity for evil that can reside within even the most affluent and seemingly respectable high-class individuals. Number 1. Ivan the Terrible Ivan V, also known as Ivan the Terrible, is remembered for a reign of inhumanity and cruelty. Widely regarded as one of the most despotic rulers in history, Ivan's actions have left a legacy of fear and loathing. One of the darkest chapters in Ivan's rule was the mass execution of Novgorod in 1570. In 1570, he unleashed a wave of attacks upon the city, accusing its residents of disloyalty. The barbarism shone out during this episode earned Ivan the moniker Terrible. Thousands perished at his hands, and the city's population was decimated. To consolidate power, Ivan created the Nina, a state within a state where he wielded absolute authority over everyone and everything. This elite force, notorious for its ruthless, merciless tactics, unleashed a reign of terror on any perceived threats to the Tsar's supremacy. The Nina's brutal methods, including prolonged torment and public executions, fueled public hatred towards Ivan. Ivan's reign was remembered by his increasing paranoia and erratic behavior. Suspecting conspiracies at every turn, he completely completely purged his inner circle, even eliminating those close to him. This atmosphere of fear permeated the court, making allegiance a precarious endeavor. As Ivan's tyrannical rule unfolded, the public witnessed a leader consumed by suspicion and cruelty. Ivan's penchant for lending out his own hands to carry out the depraved acts further solidified his reputation as a tyrant. Stories abound of him physically harming his own son, leading to his death. These instances of domestic harm shocked the populace, completely eroding
feeling any sliver of sympathy they may have still harbored for their ruler. His acts left an unforgiving mark on the Russian psyche, shaping the perception of subsequent rulers and leaders. The horrors unleashed during his reign cast a long shadow over Russian history, creating a collective memory that recoils at the mention of his name. Ivan the Terrible stands out as a despotic ruler whose reign was marked by unparalleled depravity. The mass attack of Novgorod and the Opera Nina's reign of terror and the ruler's pervasive paranoia have mixed to etch a legacy of unbridled hatred. Number five, Joseph Mengele. I'm just gonna get this out of the way now. This man is the only entry from the Second World War on today's list. And that's mainly because, well, like I said before, online guidelines make it practically impossible for me to talk about the evil German dictator or members of his party. Also known as the Angel of Death, Dr. Mengele was an anthropologist and SS physician who conducted numerous inhumane medical experiments on the prisoners in Auschwitz. He was born on March 16th in 1911 in the Bavarian city of places I cannot pronounce Germany and was the eldest son of Karl Mengele, a manufacturer of farming equipment. Joseph studied medicine and physical anthropology at several universities. In 1935, he earned a PhD in physical anthropology from the University of Munich and in 1936, he passed the state medical exams. In 1937, he began working at the Institute for Hereditary Biology and Racial Hygiene in Frankfurt, you know, Germany. There, he was an assistant to the director, Dr. Otmar von Verschuer, a leading geneticist known for his research on twins. So under that doctor's direction, Joseph completed an additional doctorate in 1938. He was particularly interested in twins as twin research was seen at the time to be the ideal way to determine how the environment or human heredity influenced the human body. At Auschwitz, he was one of a number of medical professionals who selected victims to be sentenced to the gas chambers or to be spared for his experimental research. He would attempt red fluid transfusions from one twin to the other, do amputations and try and sew it onto the other twin, stitch two twins together to form Siamese twins, infect one twin with typhus or another disease, and way too many other experiments. To the surprise of no one, more often than not the twins died during the procedures or he would have them killed afterwards just so he could do an autopsy for funsies. If one twin died from a disease, he would often kill the other as well to mark the differences between the sick and healthy subjects. The evil doctor was also very interested in heterochromia, where people have irises of different colors and he would collect eyes and body parts of his victims and send it through for research. He would inject chemicals in victims' eyes to attempt to change their eye color. Nowadays, you know, we just use contacts. I have a whole collection. He also experimented on pregnant women before sending them off to the gas chambers and caused incestuous pregnancies, always under the guise of research. He tried sex change operations, removing organs, and operating on victims without anesthesia. And if all that wasn't wild enough, he tried to prove that Jewish and Romani people were genetically inferior through his morbid experimentation. Throughout his time at Auschwitz, Joseph sent his colleagues in Germany red fluids, body parts, organs, skeletons, and fetuses that had been taken from prisoners. He managed to escape imprisonment after war, first by working as a farm stableman in Bavaria, then by moving to South America. He later moved to Brazil, where he met up with another former Yahtzee party member, Wolfgang Gerhard. In 1985, a multinational team of forensic experts traveled to Brazil in search of Joseph. They determined that a man named Gerhard had died of a stroke while swimming in 1979, and dental records later revealed that Joseph had, at some point, assumed Wolfgang's identity and was the stroke victim. Number four, Paul Bernardo. Okay, I'm cheating a little bit on this one, since I'll be covering both Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka. If you don't believe that she's just as twisted, if not more so than he is, wait till the end of this and see if I can't change your mind, because my stomach is already turning. If a lawyer is willing to be disbarred by revealing what was told to him in confidence, that's pretty telling in my book. So Paul Kenneth Bernardo is a Canadian serial killer and more, who was dubbed the Skullgirl Killer and other monikers I can't say thanks to the interwebs hating the R word, and together with his former wife, Carla Homolka, one half of the Ken and Barbie killers. So Paul was born in Scarborough, Ontario on August 27th of 1964, the third and youngest of Kenneth Walter Bernardo and Marilyn Elizabeth Bernardo. So uh, Kenneth Sr. often sexually took advantage of Paul's older sister Deborah in front of other family members and would eventually be charged with crimes involving voyeurism and P word crimes. If you need elaboration on any of the words I can't say today, I assure you someone in the comments can help. Marilyn Bernardo often withdrew from her family due to depression and agoraphobia, eventually moving into the basement. Paul presented himself being, you know, a happy, and well-adjusted youth, despite his family's dysfunction, and was an active member of the Boy Scouts. Beneath the charming facade, however, he gradually developed pyromaniac inclinations and dark sexual fantasies, one of which involved creating a virgin farm where he would 
breed virgins to take advantage of sexually. And here I thought I dodged a bullet when it came to my ex that had uh, people munching fantasies and was way too into My Little Pony. Later in life, Paul was diagnosed with sexual sadism, voyeurism, narcissistic personality disorder, and met the requirement for a diagnosis of psychopathy. So you know, that checks. After a fight between his parents when he was in high school, Paul was informed by his mother that he was the result of an extramarital affair and that Kenneth was not his biological father. Repulsed by all of this, Paul began to call his mother a salute and she reciprocated by calling him a bastard from hell. Later, after growing weary of Bernardo's domineering behavior, his first girlfriend left him for one of his friends and in retaliation he set fire to all of her belongings that he could find. Between 1987 and 1990, Bernardo committed increasingly vicious sexual crimes in and around Scarborough, attacking most of his victims after stalking them as they got off bus is late in the evening. Oh yeah, I totally feel safe right now. From May to September of 1990, Toronto police submitted more than 130 suspect samples for DNA testing and received two tips pointing to Bernardo. So they interviewed him on November 20th for 35 minutes and he voluntarily provided DNA samples for testing but was not arrested at this time for any of those crimes. During this time frame, he met and got engaged to Carla Homolka and that's when things escalated from sexual crimes to killings. While there are three notable killings, I'm just going to talk about the one that disturbs me the most for time purposes. So Although he was engaged to Carla, Paul had become obsessed with her younger sister Tammy, peering into her window and entering her room to um, get himself off while she slept. Carla helped Bernardo by breaking the windows in her sister's room, allowing him access. According to Paul's testimony at trial, Carla laced spaghetti sauce with crushed Valium she had stolen from her employer at an animal clinic. She served it to her sister, who soon lost consciousness, and Bernardo then did icky things to Tammy while Carla watched. After a minute, Tammy regained consciousness, and uh, it only gets worse from here. Six months before their 1991 wedding, Carla stole the sleeping pills from the clinic. And on December 23rd of 1990, Carla and Paul administered said pills to Tammy in a rum and eggnog cocktail. When Tammy lost consciousness, Carla and Paul undressed her and Carla applied a halothane soaked cloth to her sister's nose and mouth. Carla wanted to give Tammy's virginity to Paul for Christmas, since according to her, Paul was disappointed that he was not Carla's first sexual partner and the duo also had a video camera on hand for the experience. You can't make stuff like this up. Tammy began to vomit, they tried to revive her and called 911 after hiding evidence, dressing Tammy and moving her into her bedroom, but she never woke up. Despite being observed vacuuming and washing laundry in the middle of the night and, you know, evidence of a chemical burn on Tammy's face, the regional municipality of Niagara Coroner and Carla's family accepted the couple's version of events, that Tammy had just choked in her vomit after consumption of alcohol. After Tammy's death, Paul and Carla videotaped themselves engaging in sexual intercourse, with Carla wearing Tammy's clothing and pretending to be her. Thankfully, now Paul is in jail for the rest of his life, but Carla is out in public, living alone in Salaberry de Valleyfield. Number two, Joseph Stalin. If I had a knuckle for every time I've mentioned an evil Joseph today, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that happened twice, right? So this man was dictator of the Soviet Union from 1922 until his death in 1953. As a young man, he was a robber and an assassin, so simply, you know, bad guy stuff. For almost 30 years, he reigned with terror and violence. His decisions led to a famine that killed millions. Stalin promoted Marxism and Leninism abroad through the Communist International and supported European anti-fascist movements during the 1930s, particularly in the Spanish Civil War. In 1939, his regime signed a non-aggression pact with Yahtzee Germany, and enabling the Soviet invasion of Poland. Stalin's necessity for the Soviet Union's economic development has been questioned, and it has been argued that his policies from 1928 onwards may have only been a limiting factor. So Stalin's Soviet Union has been characterized as a totalitarian state, with Stalin as its authoritarian leader. Various biographers have described him as a dictator, an autocrat, or accused him of practicing Caesarism. He's also been labeled a red fascist. Heck, forget enemies, he even killed families of people who were fond of him. Under his rule, more than 1.5 million German women were sexually harmed, and all in all, he easily killed over 20 million people. He once said, One death is a tragedy. A million deaths is simply a statistic. In the mother of all what the bleep sentence is, he was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize in 1945 and 1948. Number one, Jim Jones. As if I was going to do a list of the worst people in the world and not include a single cult leader. In the 1950s, Indiana native Jim Jones founded the People's Temple, a group that he claimed promoted socialism and equality with religious elements of Christianity. Initially, he was, you know, not not much more than a charismatic hustler who faked faith healings by having audience plants pull chicken livers out of congregants' mouths. But as the years progressed, he demanded more and more of his followers. In the early 1970s, he moved his group to California and set them up in a commune-like settlement in Redwood Valley. After he established several locations throughout the state, including its headquarters in San Francisco, the temple forged ties with many left-wing political figures and claimed to have 20,000 members, even though three to 5,000 is a little more likely. Jones eventually came to believe that nuclear war was imminent and moved his followers again to the South American country of Guyana, which he thought would be outside the potential danger zone. 
The group lived there for several years as the People's Temple Agricultural Project, but after former members started speaking out against the church, San Francisco Congressman Leo Ryan decided to travel to Jonestown to investigate claims of uh, bad things. During his visit, a number of temple members expressed a desire to leave with him and accompanied Leo to the local airstrip at Port Kituma. There, they were intercepted by self styled temple security guards who opened fire on the group, killing the congressman, three journalists, and one of the defectors, as well as injuring nine others, including Ryan's aide, Jackie Spire. A few seconds of the incident were captured on video by NBC cameraman Bob Brown, one of the journalists killed in the attack. That evening in Jonestown, Jones ordered his congregation to drink a concoction of the cyanide laced grape flavored flavor aid. Oh, yeah, so this is where the phrase drinking the Kool Aid originates, but it was actually flavor aid. All in all, 918 people died, including 276 minors. When members wept and showed signs of dissent, Jones counseled, you know, stop these hysterics. This is not the way for people who are socialists or communists to die. No way for us to die. We must die with some dignity. On a tape, he can be heard saying, don't be afraid to die, adding that death is just stepping over into another plane and a friend. So Jones directed that the youngest folks be killed first. His wife Marceline apparently protested against this. She was then forcibly restrained, but eventually joined the other adults in poisoning herself. Some members resisted ending their lives and were injected with fatal doses of cyanide, as were those too young to drink the drink, and some others survived by fleeing through the jungle. Until 9-11, it was the largest loss of American civilian life in history, which sends a chill down my spine to talk about. Starting off this countdown, we have Gilles Garnet. Now, not only was this guy a witch, but he actually used his witchy powers to conjure up a potion that would transform him into a werewolf whenever he so pleased. That's right, he was a witch and a werewolf. In October of 1572 France, that's when Garnier killed his first victim as a werewolf. He grabbed the poor girl and dragged her into a vineyard. He then proceeded to tear the flesh off of her bones with his teeth and eat it. But he was still not satisfied after, so he went and ate another victim. He struck again the following month. He took on his werewolf form and attacked a man and ate his stomach. This kept going on and on until someone caught him. Well, actually, they didn't really know it was him at first, but they claimed that they saw some weird man like beast crouching over and eating one of the victims. That's when the authorities were like, oh shit, there's a werewolf on the loose and then they were out looking for this weird werewolf man. While they were out looking for him, people kept going missing like crazy and eventually he was caught. One evening, a group of workers were traveling across towns when they spotted the werewolf man. As they got closer, they saw it was Garnier and obviously reported his ass to the authorities. <laughs> At trial, he confessed to having stalked and murdered at least four individuals, but the number was indeed higher. In the end, he was found guilty of witchcraft and lycanthropy, and he was burned at the stake. Moving on to number four, we have Lassus Brigida. Lassus Brigida was an alleged Swedish witch back in the 1500s. In fact, she was the first woman executed for witchcraft in Sweden. Story goes that one night, her and two men met up at a churchyard cemetery with plans to resurrect people from the dead using their witchy powers. When they arrived at the church, Lassus used her powers to open the church doors. This involved her circling the place three times and then blowing into the keyhole. Magically it opened for them and they entered. While in the church, they were looking for a stole. You know, the scarf type pieces of cloth that are worn by priests? That was needed in order to complete the ritual. After finally finding it, she renounced God and swore herself to the devil. Somehow, people found out that the three had attempted to resurrect the dead and reported them. Lassus was decapitated for being a witch, whereas the other two men were just fined. That's rough, man. That's rough. I'm also glad that their plan to bring back the dead didn't work. Like, imagine they would have to fight off witches and then zombies. Crazy. Coming in at number three, we have Agnes Waterhouse. Agnes Waterhouse, otherwise known as Mother Waterhouse, was the first woman in England to be executed for witchcraft. Agnes confessed to being a witch and having a familiar named Satan, which was her cat. Later on, the cat apparently took the form of a toad. The familiar originally belonged to her friend and fellow witch, Elizabeth Francis, but was later passed along to her. Furthermore, apparently Agnes would use her sorcery for evil. In 1566, she used her witchcraft to try and cause illness to a man named William Fine, and he was not so fine. After that, she used her powers to kill her enemy's livestock and as well as cause them illness. And lastly, she also tried to kill her husband using her powers. In fact, at her trial, one of her neighbors, a 12-year-old girl named Agnes Brown, came forward and testified against her. She claimed that she was visited by a demon dog under the control of Agnes Waterhouse. So according to the girl, one day she was visited by this demon that looked like a black dog with a face of an ape with a short tail, a set of horns, and a silver whistle around its neck. 
The demon dog appeared at her home and asked for some butter. She refused and apparently later that day he returned with a knife and threatened to kill her. She said that he said that he was going to thrust his knife in her heart and kill her. When the girl bravely asked to send him, the dog just turned his head toward Waterhouse's home. On July 29th, 1566, Agnes Waterhouse was executed. Before doing so, she repented and begged God for forgiveness. She also did admit that she was sending her familiar to hurt and damage her neighbor's goods. But her neighbor, a tailor named Wardall, had such strong faith that the familiar was unable to mess with him. In the end, Agnes was hanged for her crimes. Moving on to number two, we have Elizabeth Francis. So Elizabeth Francis was friends with Agnes Waterhouse. Some even say that they were sisters. I don't know. But she was accused around the same time that Agnes was. She was the original owner of Satan, the white spotted cat and her familiar. According to Francis, she received the cat from her grandmother who was also a witch. Her grandmother, in fact, was the person who taught her all about witchcraft when she was only 12 years old. According to Elizabeth, her cat would speak to her in a strange hollow voice and also would do anything in exchange for a drop of blood, which is why they could get him to do all of their dark bidding for them. During trial, Elizabeth confessed to stealing sheep and killing a number of people, including a man named Andrew Biles. Andrew refused to marry Elizabeth after she became pregnant with his child, so she killed him. Later on, her familiar told her to make a certain concoction of herbs and to drink it and that that would terminate her pregnancy. She did, and it worked. Not only that, but when Frances finally married, she got her familiar to kill her husband and her daughter. Agnes also confessed to using her powers and familiar to kill one of her own pigs to see, you know, what it could do. And then she also killed her neighbor's cows and geese after they got in an argument. She got in an argument with the neighbor, not with the cows and geese, thought I should clarify. As I said before, the cat eventually turned to a toad on its own. So Frances was the first witch to be accused, and then she was the one who told everyone about Agnes in order to get a lighter sentence. So Elizabeth wasn't killed right off the bat. But 13 years later, she was accused again, and that's when she was killed for witchcraft. And in our number one spot today, we have Lori Cabot. The story of Lori Cabot is one that still blows my mind to this day. So Lori is the high priestess of the Salem Coven. She is well known among modern day witches. Now Lori would only ever use her powers for good and to help people. In fact, she was psychic and she would use her psychic abilities in order to help police solve a number of crimes. The first time being during the disappearance and death of Martha Brailsford. So back in 1991, two people from Salem were reported missing. That was Martha Brailsford and her neighbor Tom Mamoni. Eventually Tom returned home and said that the two were sailing when Martha fell off the boat after being hit by a rogue wave. So police began searching the bay for Martha, but they were unsuccessful. That's when one of the investigators who knew about Lori and her abilities reached out to her for her help. Using just Martha's name, location and birth, she was able to tune in and locate her. Lori then said she got visions of Tom trying to make advances on Martha, but Martha was not into it. When she rejected him, he dragged her to the side of the boat and struck her head. He then put weights on her hips and attached an anchor to her feet and tossed her overboard. She even saw exactly where in the water Martha was. And guess what? She was right about all of that. A local fisherman ended up finding her body in the location that Lori had said, and Martha did indeed have anchors and weights attached to her body. When Martha's body was located, Tom fled, and so Lori was once again asked for help, but this time locating Tom. She once again tuned in and got a vision of Tom in a cabin, and got a vibe he was on his way to cross into Canada. Not only that, but Lori performed a binding spell on Tom to make sure he would do something stupid so that he would get caught. Well, three days later, police found the cabin Tom was staying in, and it was in a small town near the Canadian border. They found the cabin because Tom made a stupid mistake. He parked his car near the cabin and he left the lights on. Neighbors called the cops because they didn't recognize the car and they knew the neighbors were out of town. Isn't that crazy? Round of applause for Lori. Now I'm starting off today's list with the first person that came to my mind 
the Great Rasputin. Close family friend of the last royal Russian family, he was originally introduced to them as a faith healer who could aid their only son, Alexei, who suffered from hemophilia. A self-described mystic and holy man, Rasputin was a figure of much debate amongst the royal court, with some describing him as a visionary and prophet, others as a charlatan and scam artist. Historians believe that his scandalous reputation and influence over the Romanovs only helped to discredit and overthrow the family. Having taken many pilgrimages to holy monasteries, he developed a reputation as a revered holy man, gaining a small circle of followers who believed in his miracles, and began leading private prayer meetings, much to the scorn and suspicion of villagers and priests. It was rumored that female followers were ceremonially washing him before each meeting, that the group sang strange songs, and even that they had joined a religious sect whose rituals were rumored to include self-flagellation and orgies. Word of Rasputin's activity and charisma began to spread in Siberia during the early 1900s, where he developed many friendships with high-ranking religious leaders, eventually leading to his introduction to the royal family. It's not certain when Rasputin first acted as Alexei's healer, with the earliest record on date being when he was summoned by Alexandra to pray for Alexei when he had an internal hemorrhage in the spring of 1907, with the young royal healing by the next morning. Due to his closeness with the family, Rasputin was allowed intimate access to the family, in situations that governesses to the young royals described as inappropriate. Appropriate. One governess in particular was released from her position simply for voicing her concerns about Rasputin being allowed around the young ones while they were clad in nothing but their nightgowns. Another one of the nursery governesses claimed in the spring of 1910 that she was seduced into sexual acts against her will by Rasputin, originally having been a devotee of the man, but was later disillusioned by him. The Empress refused to believe her and said that everything Rasputin does is holy, later dismissing the governess. It was whispered in society that Rasputin had seduced not only the Tsarina, but also the four young grand duchesses. Rasputin had released passionate letters written to him by the Tsarina and the four grand duchesses throughout society. In 1916, a group of nobles led by Prince Felix Yusupov banded together, deciding to assassinate the holy man for his influence over the Tsarina and her family. It is said that the prince invited Rasputin to his place shortly after midnight, where he offered the man tea and cakes which had been laced with cyanide. Rasputin initially said no but then began to eat the cakes, and to Felix's surprise, appeared unaffected by the poison. Then he asked for wine, which had also obviously been poisoned, drank three glasses, and still showed no signs of distress. So around 2.30 in the morning, Felix excused himself to go upstairs, where his fellow conspirators were waiting, and he grabbed a revolver and returned to the basement, telling Rasputin that he'd better look at the crucifix and say a prayer, referring to a crucifix in the room, then, you know, nailed him once in the chest. Rasputin leapt up from the explosive and attacked Felix, who freed himself with some effort and fled upstairs. Rasputin followed Felix, where he was once again impaled with an explosive, and he collapsed into a snowbank. The group of men that wrapped his body in cloth drove it to the Petrovsky Bridge, and then, you know, they all dropped it in the Malaya Nevka River. If you missed something there, it took a combination of cyanide, multiple rounds of explosives, and drowning before Rasputin met the end of time. There's no way that wasn't witchcraft. Okay, we're gonna move on before I see his face in my nightmares tonight. I already had one last night, I don't need more. So when it comes to history, some folks stand out for being a hero. Great virtue. Nobody today, though. They're all going to stand out for their descent into darkness. Mary Bateman, a woman born in Assenbury, Yorkshire in 1768, was kind of that sort of person. Her life, detailed in the extraordinary life and character of Mary Bateman, fitting title, reads like a macabre tale of deceit, poison, and a chilling transformation from a seemingly ordinary existence to a practitioner of dark arts. Raised on a farm, Mary transitioned from a farm girl to a servant in Thirsk when she reached her teens. Her life took an ominous turn when she was 20, and she moved to York and worked as a dressmaker. A year later, she found herself entangled in a burglary and subsequently fled to Leeds. Over the following years, Mary's occupation shifted from mantua maker to fortune teller and wise woman, gradually building her reputation in the shadows. In 1792, she married John Bateman, but her criminal inclinations persisted. Robberies, prison escapes, even accusations of working as an abortionist marked her darker exploits. Her criminal activities continued even after her marriage as she roamed the streets of Leeds, posing as a charitable soul, collecting goods for fire victims, only to keep the gifts for herself. In a peculiar twist, Mary joined the followers of the prophetess Joanna Southcott in 1806. She orchestrated the infamous Prophet Hen of Leeds hoax, claiming that eggs laid by a hen bore apocalyptic messages. A penny was the price of admission to witness these so-called prophetic eggs. However, the truth behind the spectacle revealed Mary's deceitful hand. She had written on the eggs using ink and cunningly reinserted them into the hen. The year 1806 marked another dark chapter in Mary's life, when she was approached by William and Rebecca Perigo. Claiming Rebecca was under a spell, Mary began feeding them poison pudding, leading to Rebecca's demise in 1808. William accused Mary of both poisoning his wife and defrauding them for charms and cures. Mary's trial in New York in March of 1809 painted a picture of a cunning and malevolent woman. The jury swiftly found her guilty of fraud and Rebecca's, well, death. 
Facing execution, Mary attempted to evade, you know, rope necklace by declaring pregnancy. A panel of matrons assessed her claim, but the jury of women found it false. So on March 20th, Mary met her end at the gallows alongside a couple of men. Oh, but her story does not end here. I wish it did. The after death fate of Mary Bateman took a gruesome turn. So after her execution, her body was displayed at Leeds General Infirmary, charging visitors for the macabre spectacle. Dissected by William Hay, her remains became a commodity. Strips of her skin were turned into charms, and the tip of her tongue became a morbid keepsake. No thanks. Next up, we have Walpurgna Hosmanen. So her life at first glance was kind of unremarkable. Born in Bavaria between 1510 and 1527, she spent her days as a midwife, aiding her community. But of course, she couldn't be good or else she wouldn't be here. Story took a dark turn in 1587 when she became one of the subjects of a ruthless witch trial in Germany. Now the charges against her were nothing short of horrifying. Witchcraft, sorcery, even vampirism. Under punishment, she confessed to a bizarre tale involving a demon named Federlin, who appeared to her in the guise of a male co-worker. She claimed this demon led her to pledge allegiance to the devil, promising to free her from poverty. As she recounted in her confession, she'd indulged in macabre rituals with Federlin and the devil himself, consuming the roasted flesh of young humans and drinking wine. She described frequent visits to the devil and her demon lover, often engaging in sexual encounters. Eh, you do what you do. Remarkably, she had the power to make her demon lover leave by simply invoking the name of Jesus. Hey, if it works, it works. Now, her confession also included acts of harm using a magical ointment that she had received from her demon lover. This ointment was used to end the lives of many, including the young and animals. Her list of alleged victims was extensive, including 41 young humans, two laboring mothers, and a variety of animals. The swift and unanimous decision of the authorities led to her conviction and a gruesome set. Before her execution by burning, she endured multiple branding ceremonies, and her right hand, the very hand she had used as a midwife, was severed. Finally, she met her end at the stake, and her ashes were discarded into a street. Goodbye. Off you go. Time to travel over to Paris, France, where we meet La Voisin, also known as Catherine de Chais. Not a lot is known about her early life. She learned fortune telling when she was young and later married Antoine Montboisin, who was active as a jeweler and silk merchant with a shop at Pont Marie in Paris. When her husband's trade business led to bankruptcy, La Voisin supported the family by practicing chiromancy and face reading. In addition to being a fortune teller, she was also active as a midwife, which developed into providing abortions. Her business as a fortune teller gradually developed into manufacturing and selling purported magical objects and potions. Also arranging black masses and selling aphrodisiacs and poison to profit from her clients' wishes upon their future. She supported a family of six though, including her husband, her mother, and her offspring. She was known to have at least six lovers. The executioner André Guillaume, Monsieur Latour, Vicomte de Cousseran, the Comte de la Patie, the alchemist Blessis, the architect Fauché, and the magician Adam Lesage. She was, once again, a French fortune teller, commissioned poisoner, to emphasize that, and a professional provider of alleged sorcery. She was the head of a network in Paris of witches. So that's how she provided all those poisons, aphrodisiacs, magical services, black masses. She had like a whole network going for her. Her organization of commissioned black magic and poison killings was suspected to have killed over a thousand people. But it's actually believed that around 2,500 people might have met their ends because of her. Yikes. Oh, and by the way, she was a central figure in the famous Affaire de Poison, in case you didn't know. Number five, Randy Greenewalt and Gary Tyson. As a two for one bonus for our viewers, our first entry on this list details the imprisonment, escape, and brutal rampage of two prisoners from the Florence State Prison in Arizona, USA. In 1974, Randy Greenewalt and his brother James were held on suspicion for the murder of a truck driver named Stanley Sandage. The brothers had shot the driver and taken his wallet before being arrested when they tried to purchase stereo equipment with the victim's credit card. The authorities realized that the killing was extremely similar to the death of another driver, Henry Weber, four days earlier. The two brothers were charged with the murders, but Randy was able to avoid the death penalty by testifying against his brother. He was sent to Florence State Prison where he met Gary Tyson. Tyson had attempted to escape several times and was serving a life sentence for stabbing a prison guard. The two men formed a plan together to try and escape with the help of Tyson's three sons who showed up to visiting day with a concealed shotgun and helped the two prisoners to overpower the guards and escape with plans of escaping to a ranch in Mexico. They quickly ran into trouble when their car blew a tire. A kind stranger driving with his wife, infant son, and teenage niece came across them and tried to see if they needed help. They were taken prisoner by the convicts and taken into the desert where they were shot and left for dead, while Greenewalt and the Tysons fled in the family's Mazda. They made contact with a woman Greenewalt had become pen pals with, who bought them a truck 
and ammunition, plans of making their way to an airplane that Gary had chartered for their escape. The police caught wind of this, and the gang was forced to try and make alternate arrangements. They made their way to Texas, where they killed a couple of newlyweds and took their car. Days later, they were met with a roadblock, which they ruthlessly barreled their way through, before being met with another one six miles down the road. The officers opened fire on the gang, hitting one of the Tyson sons who was driving. The remaining two brothers and Greenewalt were captured, but Gary Tyson got away, although he was found dead in the desert 11 days later, having died a slow death of exposure to the elements. The brothers were sentenced to life in prison, and Gary was executed by lethal injection after spending two decades on death row. Number 4. Lida Southhard, The Black Widow While not all marriages end well, and some can accurately be described as unmitigated disasters, few have ended as poorly as the various marriages of Lida Southhard. But for all her faults, no one can say she didn't take the vow of tell death do us part seriously. Lida married her first husband, Robert Dooley, in the year 1912. For a while, it seemed a good match, with Dooley's brother Edward joining them on their ranch in Twin Falls, Idaho, and the couple having a daughter named Lorraine two years later. When she was a year old, Lorraine suddenly died, having apparently drunk tainted water from a dirty well. Tragedy struck again later that year, when Edward died of food poisoning. Two months after that, Robert died of typhoid fever, and Lida was left the only surviving family member. Fortunately for her, she had taken out life insurance policies on each of her family members, and had over $4,500 to try and start over after this tragedy. She soon married William G. McCaffle, becoming the stepmother to his three-year-old daughter. When his daughter fell ill and died, the couple decided to move to Montana together. But within a year, William died of influenza, leaving poor Lida a widow once again. Bad luck seemed to follow her wherever she went, with her next husbands, Harlan C. Lewis and Edward F. Meyer, both dying of sudden illnesses within four months of marrying Lida. A relative of her first husband started to notice the pattern, and had his family's corpses exhumed and examined, proving that all had died of arsenic poisoning. The other bodies showed the same results when tested, and Lida was arrested before she had a chance to murder her fifth husband, Paul Southhard, for the insurance money. She was sentenced to ten years to life in the old Idaho State Penitentiary, where she remained as a model prisoner for the next ten years. The guards eventually stopped watching her as closely as they should have, and in 1931 she managed to remove a bar from her prison window and use her bedsheets to construct a rope in order to escape. She remained at large for over a year until she was found in Topeka, Kansas, married to her sixth husband, Harry Whitlock. She was taken into custody for another 10 years before being released in 1941. She died of a heart attack in 1958, whereupon her seventh husband, Hal Shaw, likely breathed an unconscious sigh of relief. Number 3. Nikolai Zumagaliev, The Metal Fang Nikolai was born in 1952 in the Soviet Union. He went to railway school before being conscripted into the Soviet Army. After his service ended, he tried to go to university or become a driver, but failed at both. He worked various odd jobs, including that of a sailor, a forwarder, an electrician, a bulldozer operator, and a firefighter. He spent a lot of this time fantasizing about and planning murders, committing his first in 1979 on a woman he had encountered traveling across a rural path. He committed five more murders that year, whose victims he then cannibalized, and may have committed more if not for the fact that one night he got extremely drunk and accidentally shot one of his co-workers. He was arrested, diagnosed with schizophrenia, and sent to a mental institution. He was released less than a year later, and he resumed his murders, committing two more. His ninth murder is what resulted in him being captured, as he had invited guests over to his home. He brought one of the guests into a different room, killed them, and began dismembering them with an axe. The other guests walked in on this and fled the scene before calling the police. They came to get him, but were so shocked at the sight of him that he managed to escape before being captured the next day. He was declared insane and incarcerated in a mental hospital where he remained for the next eight years. In 1989, while being transferred to a different hospital, he managed to hijack the vehicle and escape. He was able to avoid capture for two years, killing at least one more person while at large, before he allowed himself to be caught stealing sheep. His hope was that he would not be recognized and could go to jail for a relatively minor offense. The story he gave the officers didn't add up, and a colonel familiar with the case was sent to check the situation out. He identified Nikolai, and he was sent back to a mental hospital where he remains to this day. Number 2. Ted Bundy The most well-known of the monsters on this list, Ted Bundy Bundy was a cold-hearted murderer who would feign injury in order to get close to women and then attack them into unconsciousness, in order to take them to a secondary location where he would take advantage of them before strangling them to death. He would often return to the bodies of the victims where he would subject the corpses to further indignities before 
decomposition made this impossible. He later confessed to 30 murders, but the authorities believe his real body count is likely extremely larger. In one of the first examples of computers being used to investigate serial killer crimes, authorities compiled all the information they had based on witness statements to come up with likely suspects, and the computer produced a list of 26 names, one of them Bundy's. At the same time, detectives made a list manually of their 100 best suspects. When Bundy's name appeared on both lists, he became their number one suspect, but word came out that he had already been arrested. A highway patrol officer had seen Bundy cruising a residential area and fleeing upon seeing the police car. When searched, they found a crowbar, handcuffs, a ski mask, rope, and an ice pick, among other suspicious items in Bundy's car. He was soon linked to and found guilty in a kidnapping case until the authorities gathered more evidence to charge him with the murders. In Utah State Prison, he attempted an escape and was placed in solitary confinement for several weeks before being transferred to Garfield County Jail. He was then taken to the Pitkin County Courthouse, where he chose to act as his own attorney. This allowed him to avoid having to wear handcuffs and shackles, and during a court recess he was allowed into the court library to research his case, where he snuck away from his guards and fled through the library window. He made his way to an Aspen hunting cabin, which he broke into and stole food and a rifle from. He became lost in the mountains and eventually found his way back to Aspen, where he stole a car but was soon apprehended by authorities. He was sent back to prison where he acquired a hacksaw blade and spent six months sawing a hole in the bars in his window. He squeezed through the gap and into the crawl space, which led to the chief jailer's apartment where he stole clothes and walked right out the front door. During the two months of freedom following his second escape, Bundy managed to kill two sorority girls and one 12 year old girl before eventually being arrested for driving a stolen car near the Alabama state line and being sent back to prison where he remained until his eventual execution. Number one. Earl Nelson. When Earl Nelson was two years old, his parents died and he was sent to live with his grandmother and her two younger children. Even from his young childhood days, he exhibited self-loathing and morbid behavior, being expelled from his primary school as a seven-year-old. He got even worse after being hit by a streetcar and being knocked out for almost a week. Upon awakening, he began to suffer from intense headaches and memory loss, and his behavior became more and more erratic. He was in and out of prison as a young adult for relatively minor charges such as trespassing and larceny. He eventually ended up in Los Angeles County Jail, where he remained for five months before escaping and joining the Navy. He was committed to the Napa State Mental Hospital by a Navy psychologist who described him as living in a constitutional psychotic state. The doctors at the institution described him as suffering from hallucinations and paranoid delusions, but they deemed him relatively harmless. In his time at the hospital, he managed to escape three times, causing the staff to nickname him Houdini and eventually stopped searching for him. He was sent back to the hospital after trying to assault a minor, but escaped two more times before eventually being discharged in 1925. The next year, he began his string of murders. He would travel the country, pretending to be a harmless traveling Christian, looking for women with rooms to rent. He would then be invited into the women's homes, whereupon he would assault and murder them by strangling them. Not always in that order. A witness who saw him near the scene of the crime described him as a dark and stocky man with long arms and large hands, causing the newspapers to be begin calling Earl Nelson the Gorilla Man, or the Dark Strangler. He managed to cross the country, killing at least 16 women, as well as two of their children, before making his way to Canada to avoid the growing manhunt. While in the country, he killed two more people before authorities were able to track him down and arrest him at a nearby train station. He escaped from the prison that very same night and boarded a train going south back into the States. The train happened to be carrying several members of the local police force, who recaptured him and took him back to prison. He was found guilty and sentenced to death. Although he tried to appeal this for reasons of insanity, he was hanged in Winnipeg in early 1928 at the age of 30 years old after killing at least 23 people and having escaped incarceration on seven separate occasions. Number five, the servant girl annihilator. I can't believe I just said those words. The servant girl annihilator. I can't believe that's the real name newspapers went with to call this guy. I know not everyone's going to be able to get a nickname like Jack the Ripper, but you can't go around calling criminals stuff like the servant girl annihilator. Later, you're just going to inflate their ego. You're making him sound like he's a Dark Souls boss, or he's going to be jumping in the ring against Hulk Hogan and the Iron Sheik. Anyway, sorry, I had to get this out of the way before we could talk about it. I, I feel like we just had to address this name. We couldn't just look at that and move on. And you know the wildest part? He doesn't even have the craziest name on this list. Okay, let's get into it. The Servant Girl Annihilator was the nickname of a brutal night stalker who preyed on the streets of Austin, Texas in 1885, a full three years before Jack the Ripper would stalk Whitechapel and steal all the fame 
fame and fortune in the attacking women at night community. Despite his name, he actually didn't exclusively target women. Unlike his British counterpart, Mr. The Ripper, the SVGA attacked men and women, although he mostly focused his attention on women, and they were all servant girls, which is where the name came from. He ended up slaying seven women and one man, and critically injured six women and two men on top of that. All of his victims carried out the same way, attacking them whilst they slept in their beds, and then dragging them out into the streets when he was finished with them, usually with a sharp object, such as a knife or a needle sticking out of the ear. There was a wild manhunt for the Annihilator, and it's said that in 1885, some 400 men were questioned and interrogated about the identity of the Annihilator. Elected officials apparently refused to believe that it could be the work of one lone psycho, thinking there was a group of men committing these crimes together for lord knows why. While several men would end up being questioned, no one was ever successfully linked to these brutal crimes. He was never caught, but an increased presence by sheriff's department and citizens forming an armed militia to protect the streets were enough to scare off whoever was doing it into fleeing the area. And eventually, the crime stopped. So where did he go? That's the question, because he was never found. There are some who even wonder if perhaps maybe he bought himself a train ticket and found his way to Whitechapel to continue his spree. And my friends, if you're looking for more true crime stories, more rumors, whispers, conspiracies, cryptids, aliens, video games, movies, and whatever else we got, Top 5 Scary has it all. Number 4, Bible John. Everyone on this list has a weird nickname. Everybody. I'm gonna tell you that right now. I'm just gonna spoil that for you. Coming up next on this list is going to be Bible John, who's got a name that is deceptively unassuming. Bible John was an infamous executioner who preyed on women in Glasgow in the late 60s. All of his victims he met at a popular nightclub, the Barrel and Ballroom. He operated for a few years and is confirmed to be connected to at least three cases and maybe more. He was subject to one of Scotland's most extensive manhunts. He was the first time a composite sketch in the country was ever used as the front page of the newspaper. All because there were so few details about the case or just who he was. What few tidbits of trivia and information we have on Bible John, his crimes, his motives, and his modus operandus come from one of the victim's sisters, who very briefly shared a taxi with Bible John and her sister sister on the night of her death. Her very brief witness, it was only a 20 minute trip, was all the information they had to provide investigators to form a psychological profile of him aiding in the investigation. Now, the name Bible John would stem from his practice of obsessively quoting the Bible and ranting and raving about adultery to his victims before, well, you know. The statement we have with Gene Puddock states that in the short period of time they spent together, he was making nigh constant and frequent references to specific Bible passages and really hammering home how much he hated adulterous women. He preyed on brunette women who all looked fairly similar and found them all at the same nightclub, charming them and then attacking them. Their bodies would later be found naked in the streets with signs of strangulation. The only witness, one Jean Puddock, passed away in 2010 with no more leads and the case having been on ice for nearly 50 years. It's very unlikely Bible John will ever be found anytime soon if he's still out there. Number three, the doodler. Next on all this list is the doodler. Like everybody else, don't let the goofy name fool you into thinking there is anything silly or funny about this guy. Now this bizarre nickname would come about from his habit of drawing pictures of his victims before he would attack them. And I guess the drawer or the sketcher or the artist didn't quite roll off the tongue the same way that the doodler did, and that's the name they went with. The the exact body count of the doodler is unknown, but police believe that it could be anywhere from 6 to 14 victims total in San Francisco, stretching from 1974 to 1975. Several men disappeared from the city's gay community, and more were injured. And part of what made him so hard to identify is that despite the city's historically very liberal and accepting view of the LGBTQ community, at the time, the larger mainstream whole community hadn't quite got there yet. And so, several of the men who would end up surviving an attack were too worried about outing themselves to want to cooperate with the police, leading to very few victims cooperating with the police, meaning there was very little information for any of them to work with, and the criminal was able to successfully elude pursuit. Ironically, for someone named a doodler, the composite face sketch they had from witnesses is the only real bit of evidence they ever had to work with. However, unlike a lot of the other cases on this list, this one is actually still actively ongoing. There's a $200,000 reward for anyone that has any additional additional information. And as of 2019, this case is still ongoing, with DNA and fingerprint evidence being used to try to narrow down the ever-wide net of potential
potential subjects of interest and hopefully, hopefully get some closure on a horrible chapter in San Francisco's history. Number 2, The Pickler. Now I've talked about The Pickler before on this channel, but his story is so horrifying and honestly unbelievable that it's worth repeating at least once. Again, goes without saying, like every single entry else on this list, The Pickler leads you to believe this is going to be a silly story, but wait about a minute, I'll explain why he's called The Pickler and all the pieces will come together and you'll regret clicking on this video. This one's kind of a dark one. The Pickler's real name was Bella Kiss, and he worked as a tinsmith in the early 1900s, living in a humble small village in Hungary. He had been married and he had children, but his wife had left and with her took the children. He moved in a housekeeper who served as his sole faithful companion. His housekeeper would note that he seemed to entertain a plethora of female guests and was never hurting for women's attention, although she didn't talk to any of the guests much. Outside of his women callers, Kiss was actually fairly isolated. He kept to himself mostly, he didn't interact with his neighbors much at all or the community as a whole, instead preferring to tend to himself and living quietly alone with his housekeeper and his big collection of metal drums. He had a stockpile of metal drums all over his property, and when people would ask about them, he said that he was stockpiling gas. In 1914, Kiss would be conscripted to serve with the Hungarian army and left behind his home to his noble housekeeper. While deployed, Hungarian soldiers were running low on resources, and when they needed gas, some soldiers on patrol saw fit to take from Kiss's collection all over his property. However, when they went to recover the gas, they were shocked to discover what the barrels actually contained. No gas to be found, but instead the bodies of several missing women floated and alcohol in an attempt to preserve or pickle their corpses. Eh? Eh, see what I mean? Not pleasant even remotely. There were 20 barrels in total and inside each one was another missing woman. But perhaps most alarmingly of all of this is that they appeared to have been drained of their bodily fluids with punctures in the neck, which sounds made up. As if this guy wasn't scary enough, there's also the very real possibility that he might have been a vampire. Now upon this discovery, the Hungarian army immediately moved to try and locate and apprehend Bella Kiss, but discovered that that would prove quite difficult, since he had both a very common Hungarian name at the time, and he was also deployed in the middle of the largest conflict the world had ever seen at the time, and was just one more face in a green uniform. Somehow Kiss learned that he was being pursued, and faked his death by leaving behind a corpse in a hospital that had his ID. Kiss fled, and was never seen in Europe again. A few scattered sightings would report him throughout New York, but he was never found, and eluded capture for the remainder of his days. It's unlikely he's still out there, but you never know. And finally, number one, the Zodiac. If we're talking about evil people who've managed to elude capture, it might feel a little obvious to put the Zodiac as number one, you know? But he's also one of the most infamous, strangest, and scariest criminal stories in American history, so it's never a bad story. Well, it, it is. It, it's a terrible story, but it's a very interesting one to hear. The Zodiac terrorized California throughout the late 60s and early 70s, personally claiming responsibility for 37 victims. He stole headlines and media attention for years as the state was fascinated and terrified by what he would do next and if he would ever be caught. His exploits have been the subject of a few films and TV, most famously David Fincher's Zodiac starring Jake Gyllenhaal and Robert Downey Jr. dramatizing the investigation trying to find him unsuccessfully. Although he himself insisted that he left a trail of 37 bodies, the police were only ever able to connect five different deaths to the Zodiac. People would be attacked by a lone gunman with nothing seemingly connecting the cases. Motive, modus, everything was unclear. The case would become legendary when he sent his infamous letters to three separate newspapers, containing details that only the real assailant could have possibly known about the crimes, inviting and challenging police to a game to catch him. He sent out a postcard boldly displaying, my name is, and then a blank spot, with an invitation to solve one of his puzzles. If you saw the new 2022 Batman movie, Paul Dano's Riddler is directly inspired off the Zodiac, all of his methodology, taunting people, leaving weird riddles at his crime scenes, that sort of stuff. His letter were threatening, taunting, and incomprehensible. The code he wrote in would stump detectives for years, to this day, with only one of his ciphers ever being solved and it not being nearly enough to connect any dots. The riddle that was solved spelled out a confession of sorts, but it mostly served as the Zodiac gloating about the nature of his crimes and saying that he did it solely because he thought it was fun and that it was the most thrilling, fun thing a man could do, described as being better than hunting games or getting your rocks off. He didn't mention whether or not it was better than writing riddles and codes though. Now, at the time, Obviously, they looked into just about everyone they could, and there were several prominent suspects and people of interest, but nothing concrete and final. The rest of his riddles were never solved, and as far as we know, he was never caught. However, in 2018, a private team of investigators was
was absolutely determined to close the case once and for all and put an end to one of California's most infamous mysteries. They had identified an 80 year old Gary Francis Post who had passed away. He resembled the composite sketches of the Zodiac and forensic evidence had actually made some compelling arguments that could tie it to being him, but the FBI have denied this claim and say that they still consider the case open. Will it ever be closed within our lifetime? We may never know. But the one thing that's certain is that we are not going to stop trying until we get some answers. You want my theory? Personally, I think Jack the Ripper is the Zodiac. I think that would be the ultimate plot twist to the end of all of this. Kicking us off in fifth place, we have Tatuba, one of the first women to be accused of witchcraft during the Salem witch trials of 1692 to 93. It is believed that she was taken from her tribe and forced into slavery in Barbados, where she learned her skills in witchcraft from mistresses and other slaves. When the head of her plantation passed, she was inherited by Minister Samuel Paris and was then brought to Salem, Massachusetts. Tatuba was accused of practicing witchcraft by a young woman, Abigail Williams and Elizabeth Paris, who also happened to be the daughter of her owner. The girls had been showing signs of being bewitched, and it was believed that Tatuba told the girls tales of voodoo and witchcraft prior to said accusations. A neighbor of the Paris family, Mary Sibley, recommended a witch's cake be baked to reveal the names of the witches and instructed Tatuba to bake a rye cake with the victim's urine and feed the cake to a dog. Dogs were believed to support witches and their supernatural powers by following the witch's requests. When the symptoms shown by the young woman did not pass, this was shown as evidence that Tatupa possessed the powers of witchcraft. She was allowed to speak in court, becoming the first person to confess to practicing witchcraft in Salem in March of 1962. She also confessed to speaking with the devil, stating that he ordered her to worship him and hurt the children of the village, along with discussing tales of black dogs, hogs, a yellow bird, red and black rats, cats, a fox, and a wolf that she had cursed. She was sent to jail in Boston to await trial and punishment on March 7th, eventually stuck in jail until being sold to an unknown person for the price of her jail fees that Samuel had refused to pay. Coming in fourth, Mole Dyer, one of the witches that inspired the Blair Witch Project. Residing in Leonardtown, Maryland, her origins are clouded in mystery, the most popular theory being that she was a noblewoman escaping an unsavory past. Taking up an isolated residence outside of town limits, she developed a reputation as a skilled herbalist. Those skills, combined with her unknown past and secluded lifestyle, planted the suspicion of witchcraft in villagers' heads. In the winter of 1697, the weather was so harsh that many crops failed and a deadly plague swept through the town. It is believed that these were revenge from Maul, after the townspeople had been blaming her for every misfortune and hardship they faced. A meeting was held amongst town vigilantes, and they decided to form a mob to run her out of town. They set fire to her cottage in the dark of night, and Maul ran until her legs gave out, kneeling by a large rock. She raised her hand to the sky Sky, calling down a further curse to the townspeople and eventually froze to that same rock, leaving her handprint as a notice of her final act. The boulder has since been preserved as a landmark, and even though the handprint is no longer clearly visible, visitors have reported feeling profoundly uncomfortable or experiencing terrible aches and pains around it, and cameras have been known to malfunction in its presence. On the coldest nights of the year, People have reported seeing a woman with long white hair and wearing a white dress walking through the fields and woods near the town. Third place, Ray Sherwood, the last convicted witch of Virginia. Also known as the Witch of Pungo, she was born in 1660 to carpenter John White and his wife Susan and married her husband, farmer James Sherwood, in 1680, whom she birthed three sons with. Grace was a renowned healer, growing her own herbs on their land, also acting as a midwife. While no official paintings or drawings of her exist, she is described as very attractive and tall, with a sense of humor. She was known to wear trousers instead of dresses while doing yard work, something almost unheard of at the time. The first accusation of wrongdoing against her came in 1697, when Richard Capps accused her of using a spell to end the life of his bull, of which the court could not make a decision. Grace and her husband filed a countersuit which was settled out of court. In 1698, Grace was then accused by neighbor John Gisburn of enchanting his pigs in cotton crop. No court action was taken this time, and another countersuit by the Sherwoods went nowhere. In that same year, Elizabeth Barnes alleged that Grace had taken the form of a black cat, entered the Barnes's home, jumped over her bed, whipped her, and left through the keyhole. The allegations went nowhere. Same for the countersuit, leaving the Sherwood couple to pay court fees for the third time. After her husband's death in 1701, 
Grace managed to dodge further allegations until 1705 when she got into a fight with neighbor Elizabeth Hill. She sued Elizabeth and her husband for a battery and was awarded damages of 20 shillings, so roughly the equivalent to 170 Canadian dollars today. In March, the Princess Anne County Justices assembled two juries, both made up of women, with the first being ordered to search Elizabeth's home for wax or baked items that might indicate she was a witch. Led by Elizabeth Hill herself, Grace was examined by the second jury of 12 ancient and knowing women, appointed to look for markings on her body that might be brands of the devil. And they discovered two marks not like theirs or like those of any other woman known to them. On July 5th, the justices ordered a trial by ducking to take place. If Grace were to sink, she would be deemed innocent. If she were to float and survive, she would be declared as guilty and imprisoned. Around 10 a.m. on July 10th, she was taken down a dirt lane now known as Witch Duck Road to a plantation near the mouth of the Lynn Haven River. The event attracted people from all over the colony who began to shout, Duck the Witch! It is believed that her right thumb was bound to her left big toe and her left thumb to her right big toe, and then she was flung into the water where she quickly floated to the surface. The sheriff then tied a 13-pound Bible around her neck, causing her to sink, but she untied herself and returned to the surface, cementing her status as a witch. She was then imprisoned for eight years and lived quietly until her death in 1740. According to legend, her sons placed her body near the fireplace, and a wind came down the chimney, with her corpse disappearing amongst the embers. The only clue left behind was a cloven hoof print. Stories about the devil taking her body, unnatural storms, and loitering black cats quickly arose after her death, and local men ended the life of every feline they could find. This widespread elimination of cats is believed to have caused the infestation of rats and mice in 1743. In our second place position, we're traveling over to 1662 Scotland, where Isabel Gowdy, housewife to John Gilbert, residents of the Aldern region, and that's about all we know of her personal life. <laughs> it is believed that she was tortured before her confession. Methods used at the time included the use of thumb screws, foot roasting, witch pricking to test for a devil's mark, sleep deprivation, or isolation with food and water restrictions. Ugh. The specific details of the original accusation or reason for her confession are unknown, but are believed to be part of a conspiracy to torment the local minister, Harry Forbes, who was a zealous extremist who had a fear of witchcraft. And for a woman who would not have been taught to read or write, she was extremely eloquent. Her first confession described an encounter with the devil in the church at night, where she renounced her baptism and the devil put his mark on her shoulder before sucking her blood from it. Other meetings took place at several locations, where she recounted having sexual inter with the devil, who she described as a very cold and rough but great man. She detailed his appearance as having forked and cloven feet that were sometimes covered with shoes or boots. Details were given of taking a child's body from a grave and spoiling crops, along with information about covens and where they danced. The coven ate and drank the best of food at houses they reached by flying through the air on magical horses and entered through the windows, where they were entertained by the Queen of the Fairies in her home at Downy Hill, which was filled with water bowls that frightened Isabel. She claimed to have made clay figures of the male offspring of the owner of her land to cause them suffering or death and that she had assumed the form of a jackdaw bird with other members of the coven who had transformed into animals like cats and hares. Some parts of her testimony, such as her description of the king and queen of the fairies, has been cut short when the notaries have just noted, etc., because they were unable to keep pace with the volume of information being narrated to them. A little over two weeks later, on May 3rd, Isabel's second confession was transcribed. She expanded on details about the coven by providing the nicknames of its members and as many of the spirits that waited on them as she could remember, including her own servant spirit, whom she called Red River, who dressed all in black. Claims included once again having the ability to transform into animals with the individual chance used supplied. Over the duration of all of her confessions, a total of 27 benevolent or malevolent chants were given, more than in any other British witchcraft case. She testified that the devil handmade elf arrows that were then enhanced by small, roughly spoken elf boys. The devil allocated a number of of arrows to each coven member with instructions that they were to be fired in his name. If the intended target, human or animal, was touched by the arrow, she claimed that they would pass, even if wearing protective armor. Spells used to inflict illness and torment on local minister Harry Forbes were also described. On May 15th, Isabel was brought before her interrogators for a third time. Same as her first two confessions, the transcript begins by detailing her pact with the devil. Taking the information she provided previously about the elf arrows a step further, she revealed 
revealed the names of those whose lives she had ended, along with supplying names of other coven members with details of who they had unalived. She described an instance where the devil had sent her to run an errand, disguised as a hare, and how well in that form she was chased by a pack of dogs until she was able to utter the chant to transform herself back into a human. She mentioned that while dogs could not kill her in that disguise, any marks sustained would still show after returning to human form. Descriptions of dining with the devil, along with salacious details concerning sexual relations with said devil, and broad characteristics of his genitalia were chronicled. The fourth and final confession on May 27th was mainly to confirm the three previous testimonies and an attempt to elicit more information about the members of the coven. After the six weeks that it took to record her testimonies, the panel of interrogators believed they had enough proof to request a trial from the Privy Council, which was granted. While there is no official record of the exact trial outcome, it is believed that Isabel would have been found guilty and following the verdict would have been transported by cart to Gallow Hill, where she would have been subject to a public strangulation and burning the posthumous burning to ensure that she couldn't haunt the community from beyond her grave. Granted, locals to the area claim that she is the green lady that can be seen haunting them to this day. Finally, in first place, we have the only male witch on this list, Grigory Rasputin, close family friend of the last royal Russian family. He was originally introduced to them as a faith healer who could aid their only son, Alexei, who suffered from hemophilia. A self-described mystic and holy man, he was a figure of much debate amongst the royal court, with some describing him as a visionary and prophet, others as a charlatan and scam artist. Historians believe that his scandalous reputation and influence over the Romanovs helped to discredit and overthrow the family. Having taken many pilgrimages to holy monasteries, he developed a reputation as a reverent holy man, gaining a small circle of followers who believed in his miracles, and began leading private prayer meetings, much to the scorn and suspicion of villagers and priests. It was rumored that female followers were ceremonially washing him before each meeting, that the group sang strange songs, and even that they had joined a religious sect whose rituals were rumored to include self-flagellation and sexual orgies. Word of Rasputin's activity and charisma began to spread in Siberia during the early 1900s, where he developed many friendships with high-ranking religious leaders, eventually leading to his introduction to the royal family. It's not certain when Rasputin first acted as Alexei's healer, with the earliest record on date being when he was summoned by Alexandra to pray for Alexei when he had an internal hemorrhage in the spring of 1907, with the young royal healing by the next morning. Due to his closeness with the family, Family, Rasputin was allowed intimate access in situations that governesses to the children described as inappropriate. One governess in particular was released from her position simply for voicing her concerns about Rasputin being allowed around the children while they were clad in nothing but their nightgown. Another of the nursery governesses claimed in the spring of 1910 that she was seduced into sexual acts against her will by Rasputin, having originally been a devotee of him but was later disillusioned. The Empress refused to believe her and said that everything Rasputin does is holy, later dismissing the governess. It was whispered in society that Rasputin had seduced not only the Tsarina, but also the four young grand duchesses. Rasputin had released passionate letters written to him by the Tsarina and the four young grand duchesses that throughout society fueled the rumors. In 1916, a group of nobles led by Prince Felix Yusupov banded together, deciding to assassinate the holy man for his influence over Alexandria and her family. It is said that the prince invited Rasputin to his place shortly after midnight, where he offered the man tea and cakes, which had been laced with cyanide. Rasputin initially refused the cakes, but then began to eat them, and to Felix's surprise, appeared unaffected by the poison. Rasputin then asked for wine, which had also been poisoned, and drank three glasses, but still showed no sign of distress. At around 2.30 in the morning, Felix excused himself to go upstairs, where his fellow conspirators were waiting. He grabbed a revolver and returned to the basement, telling Rasputin that he'd better look at the crucifix and say a prayer, referring to the crucifix in the room, and then shot him once in the chest. Rasputin leapt up from the bullet and attacked Felix, who freed himself with some effort and fled upstairs. Rasputin then followed Felix outdoors, where he was shot once again and collapsed into a snowbank. The group of men then wrapped his body in cloth, drove it to the Petrovsky Bridge, and dropped it into the Malaya Nevka River. Number five on this list is what I'm going to be nicknaming the Scottish Witch from the Woods. I stumbled across a Scottish story about a witch where they were unable to discover her name. Hundreds of years ago, when Scotland was still being first developed, there was a village in the north of the country. This village was positioned directly next to a forest that they wanted to chop down and expand into. When they began their process of chopping down the forest, a witch, or the Witch of the Woods, came out and warned them that if they continued, she would curse their entire community. The woman would become infertile, 
the crops would never grow and people would go missing. Fearing for their safety, the group came to an agreement with this witch, where they were allowed to chop down a small section of the forest in exchange for leaving one sack every harvest of grain or produce by the edge of the forest. This agreement held true for quite a while until the community started to get less fearful and more greedy. They decided to go against this witch and chop down the rest of the forest without fear of consequence. When the witch came out of the forest again to address their betrayal, they refused to listen and they hung her immediately. Right before she was executed though, she said that the new price was three bags of grain. This fell on deaf ears though, except for one fearful farmer that decided to heed the warning for a little while. The community went on thriving until once once again, that farmer's fear was replaced with greed. He stopped delivering the grain, and that very same day, his youngest daughter went missing. The community looked everywhere, but nobody could find her until somebody checked the mill. Through the bricks and all over the walls, blood started dripping down to the ground, and they knew exactly where his daughter went. That mill has since been torn down, but it was replaced with a silo. And to this day, the locals in that area still think that that silo is haunted by the Scottish Witch in the Woods. Number three on this list is Helen Duncan. Helen Duncan was a Scottish witch who traveled throughout Europe and actually isn't that far removed from present day. She died in 1956 and is known by some to be the last Scottish witch. As a young girl, she was considered by most to be a normal, albeit outspoken and loud, growing child. It wasn't until midway through her life that she started seriously practicing witchcraft. Helen garnered a name for herself by regularly performing seances every evening and having the ability to communicate with the dead. During her nightly rituals, she would invite viewers to come and watch. These viewers had reported seeing the materialization of ghostly figures directly in front of their eyes when Helen entered her deep, witchly trance. Helen was also capable of and would often excrete a strange looking ectoplasm from her mouth while she was doing this. And if this wasn't enough, Duncan could also see things that others couldn't. At one point, the ghost of a sailor appeared and talked about a very secretive incident that had happened in World War II that the public or Helen Duncan couldn't have possibly known about. After hearing this information, the authorities realized that they couldn't have Duncan revealing any important state secrets about the war and arrested her for witchcraft immediately. It was revealed during her trial that some of her witchy ways were not what people were led to believe though. Like her ectoplasm was simply the regurgitation of a cheesecloth made to look like some type of ghostly substance. Even though some of her abilities were proven to be fraudulent, it still doesn't explain how she was able to accurately predict or say the things that she couldn't have possibly known. Helen Duncan didn't use any of her abilities to harm anyone, but the capability to potentially talk to the dead it's still very chilling. Number two on this list is Thomas Weir and his sister Grizel. What makes Thomas and his sister so scary is that nobody expected them to be involved in witchcraft at all. Up until the end of his life, Thomas was known by most to be a nice man of the community held in high esteem. However, nearing the end of his life, Thomas came clean about who he really was, telling the entire community during a religious service that he and his sister had been performing witchcraft for years. Going into deep detail about how they had consistent communication with the devil and had devoted their entire lives to carrying out his bidding. This bidding manifested itself in many different ways, most of which involved causing harm to others or, in Thomas's case, getting it on with animals. Yeah. He was a weird dude. At first the community barely believed him, but after the sister came out and corroborated his story in detail as well, they started piecing it together. Thomas was always walking around with a big black staff. The neighbors had reported hearing strange sounds in the evening coming from their home and weird lights going off. Suddenly the guy that everybody thought they knew as their nice friendly neighbor was somebody else entirely. Reports say that when he was burned at the stake, he took far longer to die than a human should. Also his staff was burned with him and it emitted an extremely strange sound and moved in unnatural directions when it was burning as if it was being possessed by some force. I suppose that in the case of Thomas and Grizel, they had done such a good job at hiding their identities as witches and had been extremely methodical with their crimes that before they died, they just had to let the world know just how evil they actually were. Number 5. Robert Fisher 
Robert Fisher was a man living in Arizona with his wife and two children, living quietly. He had worked as a surgical technician and had previously attempted to become a Navy SEAL. He was an avid outdoorsman, an expert hunter, angler, and camper, and found himself frustrated that his children didn't quite share this love of the outdoors with him. Fisher did all he could to present himself as an all-American, white picket fence, nuclear family man, but the truth was far more complicated than that. A child of divorce, Fisher had intense issues regarding separation. He and his wife fought constantly over everything, and reports from friends say that he was cruel, controlling, and manipulative to her during their marriage, refusing to let her decorate the house how she wanted, berating her constantly, and so forth. As well, he didn't socialize much outside of his family, and was described as a loner. In late 2001, his wife Mary Fisher had had enough, and after nearly 20 years of marriage, was planning on filing for a divorce. On April 9th, 2001, neighbors would overhear a loud argument from the Fisher property. Later that night, the property would explode, burst into flames. Firefighters found inside the property the bodies of Mary Fisher alongside the Fisher son and daughter. Mary had been shot and the other victims slashed. Robert Fisher himself was not recovered at the site. Robert was thought to have set off the explosion in his own home intentionally as a way of burying his evidence and his tracks, and is thought to have fled entirely, hoping to begin again under a new identity. The thought process from police being, he was terrified of Mary leaving him and afraid of repeating the childhood trauma of his mother's divorce. He saw fit to end the lives of his family rather than put them through that experience. Now, friends of Fisher had noted that there had actually been a pattern of worry behavior before this, sneaking up on a family at a picnic to scare them by firing off shotgun rounds into the air, or an altercation in which he fatally shot a neighborhood dog for attacking his dog, although the police had suspected there was foul play. Fisher was never found, and police aren't even sure if he's still alive. One detective working the case said, maybe this is all we'll ever get. Maybe this is the best we've got, knowing he did it and never finding him again. And my ghouls and goblins, if it's scary stuff you're looking for, Top 5 Scary has got to be one of the top 5 best places to watch scary videos. Ghosts, cryptids, real crimes, aliens, we got it all. Take a look through the Cursed Archives and see where it takes you. Now let's keep going. Number 4, Richard Lynn Bear. Richard Lynn Bear is an interesting exception on this list, as he's the only one of these fugitives who actually was caught. Now the problem with this is that he was not caught for very long. Didn't really take, as he escaped from jail shortly after being apprehended. Richard was wanted for the death of Sherry Hart, a divorcee and young mother who was waiting for a date on January 15th, 1984. Her date had stood her up, and she changed her evening plans to go out and have fun with high school friends Jeffrey Burgess and one Richard Lynn Bear. However, the evening would take an extremely dark turn, when Bear would make an advance at Sherry Hart. She rebuked him, and infuriated and incensed, Richard bashed her with the butt of a handgun, and ordered that Burgess drive them about an hour and a half away into the woods. Lynn Bear then dumped Sherry out of the vehicle in the woods, leaving her bleeding heavily. Burgess had told police he'd acted under the threat of his his life. As Bear had told him, he would see to it that Burgess died if he said anything about what had happened that night. However, Burgess was more than willing to cooperate with the police, leading them to finding Hart's remains and arresting both Bear and Burgess for the crime. However, Burgess would escape days before being tried from the small town county jail, where he fled, adding him to the FBI's most wanted list for his crimes and unlawful flight to avoid persecution. As of this recording, the trail had gone completely cold, and Lynn Bear was never found again and is still wanted. Wanted. Burgess passed away at the age of 46, having spent most of his life in and out of prison on various unrelated charges. Number 3, Bradford Bishop. Until I can prove that he's dead, I'm going to assume he's still alive. That's the words of Montgomery County Sheriff Raymond Knight, speaking on our next entry, Bradford Bishop. This notorious criminal has been on the FBI's most wanted list for years, and has managed to elude capture this entire time. In fact, he was taken off of the FBI's most wanted list in late 2018 to accommodate more serious fugitives, and FBI had some reason to believe he might not even still be alive. Bradford Bishop was an unusual case. As he was a fairly promising career man with no stains on his record. He was working as a counterintelligence official, a former army serviceman, and he worked as a diplomat. Life seemed to be going fairly well for Mr. Bishop, who fathered three children with his wife Annette, where they lived in Bethesda, Maryland. On March 1st, 1976, Bradford was passed over for a promotion at work that he was due for. He left the office a little bit early, telling his secretary he wasn't feeling well that day. He would then drive to his bank, he withdrew a large amount of money, and he went to fill up gas in his car and then to a hardware store to purchase a shovel, pitchfork, and a sledgehammer. 
Bradford would then return home and ended the lives of his family members one by one. He would carry their bodies into the trunk of his car where he drove them deep into the swamp nearly 300 miles away, where he buried and lit the bodies ablaze in a shallow grave, burning the remains of his once happy family. There would be a few sightings of Bradford afterwards. He was last seen buying tennis shoes with an unknown woman and a dog March 2nd. On March 18th, his car was discovered by police at an isolated campground all the way over in Tennessee. The contents of the car were unnerving. A blood soaked blanket, a shotgun, an axe, and the well for the spare tire was soaked in blood. A jury indicted Bradford and that was the last time any evidence of the case ever emerged. Now since then there have been numerous unproven sightings sporadically appearing throughout Europe mostly, but nothing that has contributed to an arrest. If Bradford Bishop is still alive, he is 86 and has still evaded capture. Number 2. The Freeway Phantom the Freeway Phantom was the self-given nickname of a serial criminal around Washington DC who has never been identified. He first made himself known in the early 1970s, seemingly taking a page out of the Zodiac's coded puzzling handbook. The Freeway Phantom taunted the police with cryptic messages and puzzles teasing his capture. 18 year old Brenda Denise Woodard was found dead in November 1971 with a note inside one of her coat pockets. The note read out as follows. This is tantamount to my insensitivity to people, especially women. I will admit the others when you catch me if you can. Signed, The Freeway Phantom. The name happened to catch on. There are a few criminals who offer to write their own monikers, but clearly The Freeway Phantom had a brand in mind. Over the course of a 17 month period, six similarly aged young black women were found all along the highway, all missing their shoes and all showing visible signs of trauma. Police had been working on what they thought had been promising leads, including an investigation into two former police officers who were being convicted of a separate crime. However, none of these investigations ever turned up anything concrete, leading the FBI to take charge of the case in 1974. However, it was around this time that the trail started to go cold, and no more deaths following the Freeway Phantom's MO appeared, luckily. Although tragically for the victims' families, no justice would ever be found either. The investigation is still active in some aspects in Washington DC, although given that it's been five decades since the first victim was found, it's hard to think that any serious progress might be made on this case. Perhaps the identity of the freeway phantom will never come to light, but at the very least, it seems as if the brutal series of crimes had stopped. Number 1. The Vending Machine When you were younger, did you ever hear about the urban legend of someone putting poison in candy or someone putting a razor blade inside of a chocolate or an apple or something and giving it out to trick or treaters? Probably have. I mean, I've even talked about it before in a previous video on urban legends. It's the kind of story that you'd hear on a playground and it would scare you and stick with you for life. You tell yourself that kind of thing only happens in the movies and no one in their right mind would ever go around poisoning unsuspecting people. But that's perhaps because you've never heard of this case. The case of the mysterious vending machine criminal in Japan. This wave started in April of 1985. People around western Japan, primarily in Tokyo, were dying under mysterious circumstances. The first victim died shortly after purchasing two bottles of a popular Japanese soda or a ramen C. In the next coming weeks, there were 35 cases of mysterious poisonings all tracked back to Orinomen C purchased at vending machines. At the time of the crime spree, the company producing Orinomen C had been running a promotion where their vending machines would give out a second bottle of the product after purchasing one. And the criminal took advantage of this fact, lacing bottles of the soft drink with a powerful poison. And he placed them inside or on top of the vending machines to deceive consumers into believing that they'd been a winner of the promotion and they'd got that extra second bottle. Shortly after, police issued citywide warnings across all vending machines to inspect each drink carefully to see if the seal on the bottle cap had been tampered. Of these 35 cases, 12 of them were fatal, making the Orinomen C tampering the deadliest product tampering case in history. Police had absolutely zero leads and the nature of the crime made it incredibly difficult to track down, as the bottles had been dispersed seemingly randomly across western Japan. As well, there did not appear to be any greater motive, no intentional victims, there was nothing to link them together, as the victims that had all been afflicted had been completely random. Police had suggested though that they think the suspect was a single agent acting alone who had meticulously planned the crime. 
A psychologist suggested possibly that the crime was carried out as a response to Japan's orderly and aggressive work culture, and that this was a lashing out by hurting unsuspecting people that the victim would never have to face. They would get a sense of rush and control, but never have to directly deal with the consequences. Whoever was behind the Orinamin sea tampering spree was never caught. There were cases across Tokyo afterwards police suspected might have been copycats, but no leads and no arrests were ever made. Number 5. Nicolo Paganini The first up on our list today of people who summoned the devil or a demon of some kind is Niccolo Paganini, who was once called the Devil's Violinist, which is quite the nickname, looks great on a resume. I didn't know the devil really hired out help like that. Paganini, which does sound a bit like a delicious sandwich, was born in 1782 in Genoa, Italy. Under his father's influence, he was given lessons by renowned violinists, quickly becoming a prodigy. His musical talents were praised, and he was given all manner of scholarships. He had his first performance at 11 and by age 15 he was already touring around Italy performing. Just in case you needed something to compare yourself to and feel bad about your own achievements. Don't feel bad. I'm 26. I haven't toured Italy once. He was particularly well known for being able to perform recitals without sheet music. He memorized everything and was apparently able to play 12 notes a second at an inhuman speed. Now while this could be explained by the fact that he'd been raised to play the violin in a Spartan-like upbringing, locals around Genoa began to whisper and tell stories of how he must have sold his soul to be able to play the violin like that. It also didn't help much that Niccolo's pale, lanky, and quite ghost-like appearance made people a bit suspicious of the guy. I get it, as someone who's very tall, lanky, and ghost-like, people ask me all the time, Taylor, did you sell your soul to be so good at YouTube hosting? The answer? Yes. Paganini was a striking man with hollow cheeks, pale skin, and very long thin fingers which did not calm any of these rumors down. These things plagued his reputation with people claiming outlandish things, saying they'd seen him with hooves, they'd seen him talking to the devil. Some say his violin was made out of the intestines of a woman he'd slain and her soul was trapped in his violin, which I guess would make it sound beautiful? Now in the end, Paganini would contract tuberculosis and found himself getting weaker and weaker as the months and years went went by. Before his death, he turned away last rites from a Catholic priest saying he didn't need him because he wasn't going to die. He would pass shortly after. Was it because he'd already made his last rites with Satan? Or was he just confident? It's up to you to decide. And if you're looking for more freaky stories of demonic possession, exorcisms, and all that jazz, we've got loads of that on the channel. If ghosts and goblins ain't your jam, we've got cryptids, conspiracies, aliens, government cover-ups, basically anything scary above or under the sun, we've covered covered it more than a few times. So click on through, hit that bell to not miss a single scream, but please do that at the end of this video, okay? We got way more scary stories coming up for you. Number four, Latoya Ammons. Our next entry on this list is Latoya Ammons and her mother, Rosa Campbell, involving an infamous haunting that is sometimes referred to as the 200 Demon House or the Demon House. That's a lot of demons. A family moved into a new house in Gary, Indiana, only to quickly discover that the house already had plenty of residents. They claimed that black flies would swarm the porch every single day in December in a climate that should reasonably have had them die off. Mother Rosa Campbell claims she heard footsteps in the basement and doors creaking and witnessed a shadowy specter of a man pacing around her living room claiming he was leaving behind boot prints. Now that's pretty scary. But the most wild claim was that this spirit man once ch her directly. Rosa's daughter Latoya claimed that she levitated above her daughter while unconscious during a sleepover leading to her friend praying for her safety until she returned to the ground. Another wild incident describes an unknown force pushing the son of the family firmly into a wall with a voice in the back of his head screaming, it's time to die. Strangely, the family didn't decide to, you know, burn the house down and move out and change state lines, but instead reached out to their family physician. You know the old saying, when there's something strange, who are you gonna call? your local general practitioner. Well, the doc visited the house and noted that he thought the behavior of the family was delusional. So the family went to Father Michael Maganote in 2012, who was called in to perform an exorcism. He believed the family had unintentionally summoned a demon and were being tormented by hundreds of demons. And the real estate agent didn't mention that, did he? In the end, the father exorcised the house and the Ammons family moved to Indianapolis in peace, where they now await a movie deal from 20th Century Fox, I'm certain. Number three, Robert Johnson. Robert Johnson could play the blues. 
real well. In fact, he played it so darn well that people suspected he wasn't just really in tune with the music, but had made a deal with the devil to pluck the strings. Johnson was born in Mississippi in May 1911 and lived alongside his nine siblings. Good gosh, imagine the rush for the bathroom in the mornings. He eventually made his way to Memphis, where he discovered his love for the blues and boy howdy could he play them. By all accounts, he was a legendary harmonica player, but initially his friends would describe him as a pretty lousy guitarist. Well, practice makes perfect, right? Well, practice and demonic transaction. Because the story goes that Johnson would disappear for a few weeks entirely and buried his guitar at the crossroads of the now famous highways 49 and 61, 49 and 61 in Clarksdale, Mississippi, where the devil retuned his instrument and blessed his hands with the unnatural skills that made him a legend. When he started playing again, he was an overnight master of the blues. Now, unfortunately, the blues is born out of tragedy and Robert Johnson was sadly no different. He passed away at the fairly early age of 27, the infamous age in which rock stars and famous musicians are purported to die with an alarming regularity. Amy Winehouse, Kurt Cobain to rattle off a few. What makes this particular death odd though is how few details exist. His death was never reported, no autopsy ever performed, no cause ever given. The only thing we have to go on is local folklore. One in particular tells the story of Johnson playing at a country dance where Johnson had been flirting with a married woman, and she gave Johnson a bottle of whiskey, which was slapped out of his hands by Sonny Boy Williamson, another musician at the exact same show. And he told him not to drink anything that he hadn't personally seen the lid come off of, which is fairly good advice. And Johnson responded by saying, don't ever knock a drink out of my hand. Johnson would die in a convulsive state three days later, with some believing that he'd been poisoned by the woman and her husband as revenge. Or perhaps it was just the devil coming back for the merchandise that he paid for. His soul. Number 2. Agrippa Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa was a scholar living in the 15th century with one of the coolest names ever. Corny Agrippa. Agrippa devoted his life to writing about the occult. Now, I can freely talk to you about the occult, the devil, and all manner of blasphemous heretical things, but things haven't always been so liberal. And way back when, even so much of breathing about the devil was tantamount to sinning, so Agrippa was not a man without controversy. He wrote of the devil in great, intricate detail. His books would include information breaking down exactly how witches cast spells and perform incantations and rituals, and even shared where they get all of their cool outfits, big hats, and big stomping boots. It's mostly Hot Topic and Doll Skill. So where did Agrippa get all of this information? Was he just making it up? Was he really in tune with the local scene? Kind of. He claimed that when he was a young man, he gave in to the temptation of Satan and ran with a convent of witches going around engaging in rituals and casting spells and I gotta be honest, that sounds awesome. I did a similar thing when I followed Grimes on tour. Eventually Agrippa is said to have cleaned up a little, got over his goth phase and said to have found Jesus and saved his soul and began to write books preaching the good word about how you should let Jesus in your life and push the devil on out of here. Surprisingly, Agrippa was never executed despite his open nature regarding his witchcraft and occult days. It's a common misconception that he was executed for his heresy, but actually in the end, Agrippa pushed people for be more understanding of demons and the devil and pushed for people to know their enemy. He wanted to save people from the devil's grasp and save them through prayer rather than just burning them all at the stake, which is a noble goal. And number one, Anna Eklund. Perhaps you've stirred, perhaps you've heard the story of Anna Eklund before. We've covered it on the channel, I think, and it was made into a popular movie, appropriately enough, titled The Exorcism of Anna Eklund, so you don't confuse it with any other exorcism movies out there. Now, Anna's story is infamous. She's a young woman from America who has the dubious award of having the world's longest exorcism spanning decades of exercising. Those demons were in their good. Those are demons with like rent control. You're not getting them out of that apartment. It will begin in 1912 when Eklund underwent an exorcism by Father Theophilus Reisinger, a Bavarian priest. It seemed like things were successful and Anna was freed, but then in 1928, Anna began exhibiting all the telltale signs of demonic possession yet again, and Reisinger returned to perform a second exorcism on Eklund. Eklund was taken into a convent on August 1928 to be dealt with round the clock. She would behave oddly, to say the least, hissing at them like a cat, flying into fits of violent rage when offered food that had been doused in holy water. This exorcism was brutal even by exorcism standard, with Eklund allegedly levitating, howling, 
hanging out the door frame. Eklund was believed to be possessed by not just any old rank and file demon, but allegedly was possessed by Judas Iscariot, big celebrity demon inside, alongside the ghost of her own father. Alongside the ghost of her own father who had an affair with her aunt and had made unwanted advances to Anna in life. After months of exercising, and not the good kind, Anna's body deteriorated. She would vomit up debris, her head and face swelled, she refused to consume food or drink. Eventually, after months and years of exorcism, on December 23rd, the final day of the exorcism, the battle was won and Anna was freed, and by all accounts went on to live a fairly normal life afterwards. A Christmas miracle if there ever was. In fourth place we have the nuns of Loudun and Louviers. Louviers? My French is... 50-50 right now. Time to hop in my little time machine and head back to 1642 when 18 nuns became possessed. Father Mathurin Picard, the nunnery director, and Father Thomas Boulle, the vicar at Louviers, were convicted on the evidence of the possessed nuns' recounts. The youngest of the group, being only 18 years old at the time, Sister Madeleine Bavin, was the initial possession victim. Her testimony was successful in throwing the church into a state of panic, alleging that fathers Picard and Boulle had taken the nuns to secret sabbats. At these gatherings, they became familiar with numerous demons, specifically including the demon Damon. Try saying that without tripping over your tongue. Nah. Testimonies quickly followed from the other nuns, reinforcing Madeline's claims, and after further investigation from the church and its authorities, it was discovered that the nuns were suffering from the classic symptoms of possession. The exorcism rites that followed were made public, enabling the entire town of Louviers to become totally engrossed in the church and its proceedings. After the exorcisms, Madeline was imprisoned for life, Father Boulle was burned at the stake, and the corpse of Father Picard, who had already passed, was exhumed and burned. Moving into the 17th century, in the French village of Loudun, an entire convent of Ursuline nuns were possessed by a series of demons with names such as Leviathan, Astaroth, and Zabulon. These nuns appeared during a series of trials that accused the parish priest, Urbain Grandier, of having made a pact with Satan. Photos of the signed pact still exist, with autographs from the devil and the previous mentioned demons possessing the nuns. In a series of public trials and exorcisms, these nuns barked screamed, convulsed, and spoke in devil language. These sites led to a public hysteria that ultimately ended in Urbain being burnt at the stake. The events of the Loudun possessions were turned into a book by Aldous Huxley called The Devils of Loudun in 1952, which was then adapted as the 1971 film The Devils. Anyone want to have a movie night? In third place, we have John Jenkin, who also happens to be the most recent case on this list. In the summer of 2013, 25-year-old John from Cumbria, England, expressed fears that he would kill his mother. If it was just a fear, you can't relate some days. Well, in his deranged state, he approached a random van driver, put his hands in the air in a surrender motion, and cried out, I am armed, but it's not in my hands. Desperate to avoid committing such an atrocity, John tried to end his life by downing a cocktail of whiskey, painkillers, LSD, and uh, attempting to end himself in a river. He was discovered later that day, unstable, and smeared with his own red fluid after uh, self-inflicting. After these events, John was admitted to a psychiatric hospital, where staff judged him as low risk and released him. I'm no expert, but I'd hate to see high risk if that's considered um, minimal. Later that evening, he confessed to a group of friends that he was possessed by demons, stating, I am the devil, I need to confess. He said his mother had become aggressive and controlling after the events of that day. In that same night, his sister Katie had confided in one of her own friends that she was really worried about her brother, saying that he didn't seem like her brother and he didn't look like her brother anymore. The next morning, after a brutal argument with his mother and sister, he went downstairs and hit his mother with lots of blows to her head with a sharp end of an axe, and when his sister came downstairs, he attacked her as well to stop her from screaming. I guess the sister was sadly right to be worried. Now, after the killings, John was found stark naked, crouched behind a bench, acting erratically. When a police officer asked him if he had taken anything, he simply replied, lives. A court has since sentenced him to a minimum of only 12 years in prison. In second place, time to meet Michael Taylor. In the 1970s, Michael Taylor was largely an ordinary figure in the town of Osset, Yorkshire. He, his wife Christine, their five children, and their pet poodle lived peaceful and happy lives. And now to, um, 
pop that Stepford Wives bubble. In 1974, Christine stated to a Christian fellowship group, to which they both belonged, that his relationship with the leader of the group, Marie Robinson, was carnal in nature. Michael admitted that he felt evil within him and eventually attacked Marie verbally, who screamed back at him. Marie stated that his eyes changed to something bestial and that he began to speak in tongues. Michael had no memory of the event, something all too common in cases of possession. During the next meeting, he received an absolution, but his behavior continued to become more erratic. As a result, the local vicar called in other ministers experienced in deliverance in preparation to cast out the demons residing within the man. The exorcism, which occurred between the 5th and the 6th of October, 1974, at St. Thomas's Church in Gauber, was led by Father Peter Vincent, the Anglican priest of St. Thomas's, and was aided by a Methodist clergyman, the Reverend Raymond Smith. Over the next eight hours, Michael would repeatedly have crucifixes stuffed inside of his mouth while being doused with holy water. Okay, now my jaw hurts. According to Bill Ellis, an authority on folklore and the occult in contemporary culture, the exorcists believed that they had, in this all-night ceremony, invoked and cast out at least 40 demons, including those of incest, bestiality, blasphemy, and lewdness. In the end, exhausted, they allowed Taylor to go home although they felt that at least three demons were still left in him. While at home, he brutally ended his wife, Christine, by attacking her with his bare hands, tearing her eyes and tongue out, and almost tearing her face off. He was eventually found by a policeman, completely naked in the street and covered in red fluid. At his trial in March, he was acquitted on the grounds of insanity. He was sent to Broadmoor Hospital for two years, then spent another two years in a secure ward in Bradford before being released. I'm seeing some repeating factors here, are you? Finally, in first place, we have Arne Cheyenne Johnson, otherwise known as The Devil Made Me Do It. Now, before I talk about his exact crime, we have to explain how he came to be possessed. Satan originally possessed David Glatzel, the 11-year-old brother of his fiance, who was living with a couple. Strange happenings first began in the summer, when young David would jolt awake in the middle of the night, sobbing in fear after being visited by a hideous creature that he described as a man with big black eyes, a thin face with animal features, jagged teeth, pointed ears, horns, and hooves. The beastly apparition had issued a warning. Beware. Very quickly, the visions amplified, with David's beast now haunting him during the daytime. Each time the child experienced a visitation, deep scratches would appear on the front door of the family's home, and red marks would appear on David's body. Thankfully, everyone in the household believed his claims. According to his sister Debbie, it was out of character for him to lie, describing that he never liked anything spooky, not even scary comic books. Becoming increasingly worried for young David, a priest was summoned to bless the house, but that accomplished a big fat nada. The possession had escalated to such heights that the family were now taking shifts to monitor him during the night. Eventually, the involvement of paranormal investigators, some of my favorite people to discuss on this channel, Ed and Lorraine Warren, was begged for, and luckily for the family, they were available. With her strong powers of clairvoyance, Lorraine described encountering a black, misty form during her first meeting with David, knowing immediately she and Ed were dealing with something of a negative nature. Lorraine has stated over the course of several visits, David made numerous references to ending and stabbings. In an attempt to save David from his endless tormentors, Arne taunted the demons during exorcisms to enter his body and leave the boy alone. And sadly, the challenge was accepted. Look, I'm all for saving kiddos, but there's a limit. You don't want to actually invite the demons into your body. Over many months after that fateful day, Arne's fiance reported that he would go into a trance, where he would growl and say he saw the beast and later would have no memory of it. It was six months later, on the 16th of February, 1981, shortly after 6 p.m., that Arm brutally attacked his landlord, stabbing him in a frenzy as he growled like a beast while Debbie watched, unable to react. The landlord passed away later that evening. At his trial, Arm pleaded not guilty to the ending charge, with his defense being the demonic entity which inhibited his body had caused him to do it. Number five, Julie Brown. Our first witch today on the list of which witch is which is Julie Brown, legendary voodoo priestess of the swamps. New Orleans is filled to bursting with two things, the most wondrous advancements in soul food and gumbo technology on the planet, and ghost stories. There's a whole lot of voodoo to go around in Louisiana, and in Manchac they say there's the ghost of an old voodoo priestess named Julie Brown. 
The story of Julie Brown is an unnerving one. I would certainly hope so, otherwise it wouldn't be on this list. She was said to be reclusive, would sit on the porch of her swamp shack and spend the day cackling, predicting the demise of nearby towns and its residents, singing twisted songs about her death and the apocalypse and the end of days. Despite the fact that she was a kooky old lady singing songs about the apocalypse on her front steps, locals actually feared her and treated her as an oracle and a prophet and were very nervous of wronging her just in case she placed a hex on them, which, you know, is reasonable. You should always treat everyone you meet with kindness just in case they turn out to be a witch who can hex you. The prediction she's most known for, besides one bizarre correct prediction about the 1994 Super Bowl Cowboys at Bills game, was her threatening prediction in 1915, where Julie Brown would cackle over and over and over that she was going to die and take everyone with her. She chanted this again and again, until her death. On her funeral, a hurricane hit the town, decimating three villages and taking countless lives. Julie is said to be buried in the swamp, and locals believe it was her spirit that caused the hurricane. And if you happen to be passing through Manchac, just pay your respects to Miss Julie Brown. Like I said, you never know what kind of secret somebody has. And if you're looking for more stories about witches or really any kind of urban legend, Top 5 Scary has all of that and then some. I'm not kidding. If you can think it up, there's pretty good odds we've done two to three videos on it. We got something scary for everything under the sun and above it. So hit subscribe. Please make sure you hit that little bell so you don't miss a single scream, but do that after this video because I got four more witch stories coming up for you right now. And wouldn't you know it, the next one's about a bell. Number four, the Bell Witch. In the 1800s, a farmer going by the name of John Bell moved his family to picturesque Adams, Tennessee, onto a beautiful 300 acre farm, little slice of American pie. Bell quickly became a figurehead of the community, respected by many, and became a local leader at the town church. For the Bell family, things were the brightest they've ever been. They were living the dream and ringing in good fortune. I was trying to make a Bell pun work there. There's probably a better one. Things wouldn't be good for long, and they'd find themselves in a nightmare shortly. By 1817, strange, inexplicable things started to occur all around the farmstead. John Bell found a strange animal on the farmstead, a mutant hybrid that resembled a grotesque mix between a dog and a rabbit. I know that sounds like it would be cute, but I think if you get the wrong parts of both, that's just gonna turn out to be a very, very ugly animal. I think dog, rabbit ears, pretty cute. Maybe like dog, rabbit face, dog, rabbit body. I don't know, mess. Anyway, it was a disgusting thing. The younger members of the Bell family would wake up covered in red scratches all over their bodies at all hours of the day. The family would hear faint whispering and singing that sounded like an old woman singing hymns. Most tragic is the Bells found a mysterious vial of liquid inside their home that no one could explain or understand. Nervous about what it was, the Bells offered the mystery liquid to their cat, which passed almost immediately. Rest in peace, Bell Cat, taken too soon, undeservedly. You didn't deserve to be an experiment for them. For three long years, the Bell family was tormented by a mysterious entity that would later become known as the Bell Witch, after the mysterious old woman's humming and singing. In 1820, John Bell quickly grew extremely ill, quickly descending in his health, and would pass away later. At his funeral, the mourners complained they could all hear the laughing of an old woman mocking and singing the fate of the late John Bell. The farm became a haunted attraction, where it still is to this day, and it even caught the attention of President Andrew Jackson, who in 1819, a year before Mr. Bell's passing, visited to see if legends of the witch were real. Allegedly, allegedly. As soon as his carriage arrived at the property, the horses refused to budge anymore. The animals can always tell. Number three, the black hag. Our next witch probably has the most impressive title out of any of them, the black hag. That is such a cool name for a witch to have. She resides in a church called, oh God. <sighs> Let me try this. The Monaster Nagal, oh. What, you wanna throw that on screen for me? Monster and I, I, how, am I, how am I supposed to say that? This is the witch's curse. I don't even know about any witchy stuff she does. She tries to get you to say this evil word and then it curses your family. I'm getting a note. 
Over here it says that it's also called the Abbey of the Black Hag. Well that's that's what we're going with. We're not calling it that other thing. I'm not doing that. The Black Abbey of the Hag, which as far as I know is the only name this church has ever gone by, was built in 1298. Wow, it's an old church. And was one of the few well-known medieval convents in old Ireland. The remains of the abbey still stand today in a secluded valley, making an already mysterious and supernatural place just that much more atmospheric. The place is called the Abbey of the Black Hag, for God's sakes. You don't name a place that unless it's pretty haunted. Sounds like it's straight out of Dishonored. And while I've got you here, Dishonored 3, when? When's that happening? Now, it's believed that the last abbess, which is a horrible word, in charge of the abbey practiced witchcraft, and in the scary way. She brought death, misfortune to the surrounding areas. Pope Martin V condemned the abbey. He was not down for witches at all. Catholic Church don't play with witches. The accused witch left to live out in the damp, deserted abbey by herself, which she probably loved because that sounds scary. Over time, her skin blackened, her hair furled, and her soul twisted, leading to the place being named the Abbey of the Black Hag. And if you can believe this, there's actually more to this story. The Count and Countess of Desmond once called the Abbey home when attempting to flee their attackers, where the Countess was fatally struck by an arrow and buried by her husband, but it would not be the end of the Countess. Sightings of a ghostly figure around the ruins of the Abbey were common, eventually leading to someone digging up worn out finger bones. And it's said now that a woman's panicked shrieking can be heard in the early hours around the Abbey. Number two, the Blair Witch. Perhaps one of the most pervasive witches in pop culture after the Wicked Witch of the West, the Scourge of Maryland, the Blair Witch. Perhaps you saw the very successful 1999 documentary regarding her legend, or maybe you saw one of the two middling sequels. According to legends, she haunts the Black Hills Forest near the town of Burkittsville, Maryland. The local folklore states that in the 18th century, a woman named Ellie Kedward was accused of practicing witchcraft. She was chased and exiled out of the township of Blair and condemned to live in the woods, hence the Blair Witch. It's believed that she died out in the surrounding forests in the harsh winter of 1785, but it's also said that she placed a curse on the town moments before her death, vowing to seek revenge on the townspeople and their descendants for generations. And not to split hairs here, but that does actually kind of sound like she was a witch. I'm not saying it was justified in exiling a woman out of her town, just that placing a hex on a town definitely sounds like witchcraft and I can understand where they were coming from. I'm just trying to understand the scenario, okay? I'm divorced from it, I'm not part of it. I'm just trying to understand it. From here, the legends of Kedward grew into the larger than life figure, the Blair Witch. Camera crews disappearing in forests, reports of finding strange hex bags in the surrounding woods filled with strange runes and symbols and remnants of people, hair, teeth, for her to perform wicked rituals. Now, it goes without saying, unless you firmly, firmly believed the marketing campaign of the 1999 film, the Blair Witch Project is obviously a movie. While they say it's based on the real story of Ellie Kenward, there is no record of a Blair Township ever having existed. Almost certainly, the Blair Witch's story is inspired in large swaths by the Bell Witch, who we talked about earlier. Although in a kind of unique case, back in the day when the Blair Witch did come out, its marketing was so effective, and in this sort of like pre-early internet area, there were several people who did think it was real. It was a cast of completely unknown actors by a team no one had ever heard of. And on some level, I don't know, maybe to get esoteric with it, what makes an urban legend real? Just us believing in it, right? Do you believe the other four stories I've told you more? They're no less fictional. My only source was the internet for all of those. So, I'm just saying, open mind. Number one, La Bruja de Cachiche. And our final witch for today is going to be La Bruja de Cachiche, a well-known urban legend from Peru, specifically from the coastal town of Cachiche near the city of Ica. The legend revolves around a reputed witch who lived during the colonial era. According to legend, La Bruja de Cachiche was an enigmatic woman with exceptional powers and knowledge of witchcraft. She was believed to possess both healing abilities and the abilities to cast curses. She multi -spect. It was said that she used various herbs, potions, and rituals to perform her magic. Now, one of the most interesting aspects of this legend is this belief that La Bruja de Cachiche had a physical deformity, specifically a hunchback. And if there's one thing we love in an urban legend, it's a bit of a physical deformity. It makes it that much more believable and scary. 
because someone conventionally unattractive is way scarier than not. Don't blame me, blame our western views on beauty. I didn't write them, I just perpetuate them. Over time, the legend of La Brahuda de Kashish became intertwined with the history and culture of the town of Kashish. Local residents and visitors began associating certain landmarks and natural phenomena with their presence. For example, there's a famous gnarled and twisted tree called the Witch's Tree that is said to have been her gathering place. Today, Kashish has embraced the legend of La Brahuja de Kashish as part of its heritage. The town has a statue of the witch and there are various festivals and events dedicated to her and I guarantee you no party goes even half as hard as a party celebrating a local witch. Oh my god, imagine the cauldrons do. The legend has also become a popular tourist attraction, drawing visitors who are interested in the occult, folklore, and statues. That's all she wrote for this one, my ghouls and goblins. Thanks so much for watching. You creep on creeping on, and I'll see you in the next one, provided no witches of the woods have taken me away.